Alrighty, I think we're good to go. Hello, everybody. My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I have a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania here in wonderful Philadelphia. And as we inch closer and closer to the light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, uh, more studies have been done regarding the consequences of catching the virus. One of the most frequent topics that people have brought up in discussions and live discussions is, does COVID-19 affect the brain? And there are good reasons to think about this. So it's a topic that naturally, you know, I've followed since the virus reared its head. And it's something I've discussed over the past few months as studies have come out. And I have links to those discussions in the descriptions uh, below. But the short story is that from the time that the virus started spreading outside of China, folks in the U.S. started and in Europe started noting that there were some people who seemed to exhibit symptoms that would typically be associated with neurological issues. And to be clear, you know, the majority of people who come down with the virus don't seem to exhibit these symptoms, just some of them. But a pretty meaningful proportion of people who do catch the virus do exhibit symptoms like impaired consciousness, headache, confusion, stroke, and perhaps most infamously, the loss of uh, the sense of smell or anosmia. And so, you know, autopsies of, of people who were done, you know, uh, or who were lost uh, due to COVID-19 have found RNA transcripts of the virus in various parts of the nervous system, including the olfactory bulb. And, and the most recent study I discussed found um, that a specific component of the virus, um, a part of the spike protein, which you can see these little knobs uh, on the, end, on the uh, outsides of the ball there, a specific uh, component of the spike protein has been found in the brain tissue of animals, suggesting that if this component of the viral particle is disassociated from the viral particle, it might be able to gain entry into the brain. And you know I've linked uh, a, a to that discussion below. But all this to say, there are good reasons to wonder if there might be some nervous system effects of COVID-19. But the question, however, is whether these symptoms seem to be, or the, these symptoms that seem to be neurological are attributable to a direct effect of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, on the nervous system, like literally viral particles infecting neurons, or if there's a more indirect mechanism, something like a runaway immune system reaction, you know, where there's such a severe inflammatory um, response or a cytokine storm uh, that, you know, in some cases results in the nervous system being affected and damaged. So in other words, you know, is it the virus itself or is it the body's reaction to having other cells in the body infected by the virus? So, you know, you might wonder why we don't already know the answer to this question, you know, given how many people have now been infected with the virus and how many, you know, uh, people have been lost, you know, to the disease that it causes. Um, and there are a bunch of challenges to exploring this question, not the least of which being that, you know, it seems like, again, only a subset of individuals experience neurological symptoms to begin with. And then of those individuals, only a subset are lost to the virus, of course, and then only a subset of those who are lost are scientifically evaluated. Well, there was a study that was published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, right here, you can see, um, that explores this question. And so, you know, the fundamental strategy that this group um, uses revolves around a method um, that, that's called organoids, or a method that, that uses something called organoids. And so at its simplest level, don't worry, I'm not going to go too deeply into organoids, it, it's just a miniature version of an organ, right? The idea is basically to grow a small version of an organ outside of an organism. <laughs> right. So if you're interested in understanding the biology of like the human gastrointestinal tract, right, or the gut, instead of having to study humans, which is a messy and difficult business, you can just grow a miniature version of the gut in a Petri dish. You know, that way you can explore any question that you might have regarding how various molecules interact with the biology of the gut without either having to like find the perfect population of humans who happen to be exposed to those molecules or, you know, figuring out a way to get them to agree to being exposed to those molecules. Right. And so, you know, to be clear, these are... Um, I'm sorry, there are organ, uh, organoids that have been produced for multiple organ systems, right? Um, but of course, for our purposes, it's the organoids of the brain <laughs> that are directly relevant, right? And so in neuroscience, we very regularly accept, you know, suboptimal conditions when conducting experiments. And these concessions that we make come in multiple forms. One form is when we work with animal models to understand how a given drug or environmental treatment or whatever affects humans. You know, while the brains of um, a human and a chimpanzee or a rhesus macaque are pretty remarkably similar. The differences are obviously pretty meaningful. You know, after all, there are some pretty substantial differences between how humans behave relative to literally every other primate, including our two friends here. <clears throat> so in 2008, um, some biomedical scientists in Japan at an institution called the Ricken Center, uh, which is one of the best biomedical um, institutions in the world, um, they developed this strategy of using human stem cells that organize themselves uh, into structures that sort of resemble a brain. 
And so just to give you an idea of what these um, organoids look like, um, <clears throat> this is an image that I got from an article in Quanta Magazine by Jordana um, Sepelowicz, I believe, Sepelowicz, Sepelowicz. Um, and I've linked again to, the, to that article in the description below. So, so what's the appeal, right, of working with organoids rather than just neurons that are sitting in a Petri dish, right? Why these instead of just neurons? Fundamentally, it's because, you know, the cells that compose an organoid, you know, literally those are the little blobs that you're seeing in that Petri dish, they're living in an environment that's quite a bit more similar to the brain than, you know, if they were to just be sitting disassociated or, or very loosely associated with one another in a Petri dish, right? The neurons in an organoid are able to form connections with each other in 3D space, um, and, you know, they can influence and, and interact with each other. So, you know, studies of how those neurons react to various treatments, whether it's a specific drug or a hormone or, or you know, a change in the environment, or most relevantly to the paper I want to discuss today, exposure to a specific virus, those studies will yield results that are, you know, more similar to how the neurons in the human brain would respond than if we were to just, again, you know, study a collection of, of neurons that aren't all surrounded by other neurons and other brain cells, um, you know, uh, uh, in a Petri dish. So, you know, in other words, like an organoid is like studying a version of an organ that's somewhere between studying, you know, just a set of cells in a Petri dish and studying the neurons in the brain of another primate of some kind or a human. So, you know, and also these cells are alive, right? So, so they're not dead. Um, so there's a, like a whole interesting conversation uh, to be had regarding the ethics and the neural philosophy of neuronal organoids uh, that involves questions like what do we consider to be consciousness and what do we consider to be conscious, right? And just to sort of tease this topic because it is pretty fun. Let's imagine that, you know, some of those neuronal organoids in that picture are about the size of the brain of a second trimester fetus. Right. Of course, it's not inside of a developing body, or it's not inside of a body, not in, not in the womb, but it's just sitting there in, in a petri dish. Or what about a third trimester fetus? Or assuming that science, you know, progresses sufficiently, what about a six-month-old human baby? Right. What would the experience of those organoids that aren't inside of a body or in you know in a developing developing in a womb? What would the experience of that complicated of an organoid be? You know, to be clear, like, I think a lot of the concerns regarding this topic aren't actually worthwhile. We don't really need to worry about them too much, but, you know, at least at the current state of the science. But, you know, I just couldn't help myself, you know, just put a little neurophilosophical pin in that topic right there. So anyways, back to the topic at hand. So um, this group evaluating whether SARS-CoV-2 or sars coronavirus 2 the, the virus that causes COVID-19, this group evaluating whether it's capable of infecting neurons worked with organoids to help answer the question. Okay, and, and it's worth noting that this is not the first time that brain organoids were used to understand the interaction of, you know, a specific virus and neurons. Do you remember the Zika virus? You, you know, couldn't be blamed for, for you know, forgetting all about the Zika virus. But there was an epidemic around 2015 throughout South, Central, and North America, as well as in the Caribbean. And it's just like, it's a super strange virus, and it's, it's not, it's totally unrelated to coronaviruses, you know, like, at, while you know SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, it's more closely related to like the dengue, yellow fever, and West Nile viruses, and it's spread by by mosquitoes. And it doesn't necessarily cause a particularly severe reaction, but it turned out that if pregnant women became infected, it was possible that a developing fetus might um, develop microcephaly, which is essentially like a restriction of head growth, which inevitably restricts the development of the brain. Right, you just don't have enough space. Um, I'd all but forgotten about Zika by the time COVID-19 reared its head, but um, I now remember that my wife and I, you know, while we were working on making a new human, uh, we decided to turn down an incredibly generous invitation by some friends to visit their family's house on the coast of Mexico, specifically because of Zika. But anyway, so, so during the Zika virus pandemic, uh, particularly, you know, given the incidences of microcephaly, <clears throat> there, was, there was interest in understanding if the virus was able to interact with the nervous system. And just like the paper I'm discussing now, biomedical scientists um, used organoids to, to try and answer those questions. So we're now in the midst of a global pandemic, right? And there's you know more than enough reason to be concerned about um, possible central nervous system effects. And, and so um, a new group uh, has used this same you know pretty cutting edge technique to try and understand whether SARS-CoV-2 is capable of interacting with neurons directly. And so this paper asked quite a few questions, um, but, but the headline finding of this paper is at least some of the neurological symptoms of COVID-19 that some people exhibit may be due to, and I'm going to quote here, consequences of direct viral invasion of the CNS, central nervous system, specifically 
our work experimentally demonstrates that the brain is a site for high replicative potential for uh, SARS-CoV-2. We further show that SARS-CoV-2 causes significant neuronal cell death in human brain organoids. So, okay, what did they find? So, so they found evidence that one, the virus seems to be able to utilize the molecular mechanisms that, that are you know, used to make proteins and some neurotransmitters and stuff like that to replicate within neurons. Okay, and so you can get a sense of how they observed um, that with this picture from the paper here. <clears throat> and so, you know, where, where this first panel, this first group of images, um, you're basically seeing, you know, two examples by row, two examples of um, what COVID-19 infective neurons uh, sort of look like, right? You know, so basically each row is um, a different sequence of pictures from a different region within a, a brain organoid. And they took these 96 hours after infecting the organoid with the virus. So in both rows, um, they made it so that neurons will look red if they're infected with SARS-CoV-2, if they're infected with the virus. In the first two pictures, right, this column, um, so and one on top, one on bottom, right, um, you're, you're seeing fairly zoomed out images of the organoids. So, you know, you're seeing thousands and thousands of neurons in the picture. Basically, wherever you see little blue dots, I know they're kind of difficult to see right now. Um, those are the, the cellular nuclei of all the cells in, in that area of, of the organoid. The next two pictures in this row, um, the ones in the middle, right? You're seeing uh, neurons that have uh, been turned green, essentially, uh, by making it so that anywhere there's either SOX2 or MAP2, right, uh, you'll see green. So, so this is fundamentally a, a, a way to identify the presence of, of cells, okay? And, and then, as is through the tradition, of course, the virus is red, or the presence of the virus is red. So, and then in um, D, so that's this one over here. Um, I unfortunately cropped off the, the letters there, but on this image here, you're seeing a very zoomed out picture of, of a whole brain organoid where, you know, you can see the infestation of mostly the outer layers of the organoid with um, the virus. And by the way, I'd never allow uh, such poor tiling uh, to leave my microscope room. You can sort of see like the little um, squares of images that were tiled together. And that's due to poor shading and, and stitching, but whatever, that's besides the point. Um, but the point is here that you can see um, that you know, neurons in this uh, um, or, or, or in these brain organoids are um, certainly capable of being infected by SARS-CoV-2. They're capable of being infected. So that was the first finding. The second finding um, in this group's paper was uh, that neuronal um, loss has been observed in patients who were you know, lost to COVID-19. And it turned out that their organoids exhibited neuronal cell death, cell death as well. And so their findings were a bit more complicated than that, but, but it seemed like infected neurons somehow changed their local environments, their microenvironments, such that their neighboring cells are negatively affected. And you can get a sense of what that is in these pictures here. So just as in, uh, um, in the, the last uh, couple of pictures, um, these are like pretty zoomed out uh, pictures of, of their organoids, but um, the, there are two primary differences between these two pictures. So first, the image on the left is a mock infection, meaning that um, it's not been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, the image on the right is of an organoid that has been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And then also in both, right, you can see that they're staining for, they're identifying the presence of tunnel, right, which is basically a test to detect whether a process called apoptosis is occurring. And apoptosis is, is essentially a process by which cells in the body die. Um, essentially any kind of cell in the body can do this, uh, can undergo apoptosis. And then, so as you can see, there's considerably greater presence of tunnel in the organoid infected with SARS-CoV-2 relative to the one that's just mock infected, suggesting that the virus does indeed cause neuronal cell death. And by the way, you likely hear people pronounce this word as apoptosis, um, and that's a and despite its spelling, that's actually the incorrect pronunciation. It's actually supposed to be pronounced apoptosis. It's it's a cool Greek word that that refers to the falling of petals from flowers or leaves from from trees. And so, after discussing with uh, evidently the story goes, after discussing um, with a friend in the department of Greek um, at, at their university. Um, the person who, who developed the concept of, of apoptosis suggested that the process ought to be pronounced without the P, right? without that, that second P, sort of like you know, pneumonia or pterodactyl. Right? So, but most people do say, including biomedical scientists, by far the majority say apoptosis. Um, but now you have the ability to outnerd even some biomedical scientists because you now know the real pronunciation of apoptosis. So, and by the way, don't get me started on stereotactic versus stereotaxic. Um, even that's an even nerdier debate, uh, but and probably less interesting to essentially everybody, including scientists. But anyway, so 
The third thing that this group explored was whether the ACE2 receptor, right, which is the thing that um, we're pretty sure SARS-CoV-2 needs to find, that needs to, to be able to interact with to infect any given cell, is present throughout the brain. So this group found that um, the ACE2 protein was detectable in their organoids, suggesting that it may very well be present in neurons within the brain, rendering them vulnerable to infection with the virus. Totally makes sense. So the group also explored um, some of the neurophysiological consequences of SARS-CoV-2 infection in mice. So they found that infection caused um, changes in the brain vasculature, okay, which may, it may help explain um, the cases of strokes among people who've been infected with the virus, as well as some of the other neurological symptoms potentially. So evaluations of people who were lost to COVID-19 have found evidence of the kind of damage that's associated with strokes, specifically ischemia, without any detectable blood clots. Um, and, and that's what this group observed as well in their study. So in other words, it seemed like small areas of neurons were damaged in a way that might resemble a stroke, but there weren't any of the typical signatures of you know, the typical things that, that cause strokes. So it's possible that the virus itself may produce this damage in some way without technically inducing a stroke or in technically inducing an ischemic stroke. So you know, one bit of evidence um, that this group found suggests that the virus may change you know, the metabolism of the neurons that it infects, meaning like how the neurons produce and use biochemical energy. And then because of that change, the neighboring cells are robbed of their energy supplies that, that you know, they're used to receiving and then results ultimately in, in the eventual death of those neurons, the apoptosis of those neurons. And so you know, it's worth mentioning that um, this group assessed the brains of three patients who were um, all lost to COVID-19, all of whom were admitted to the ICU. They were sedated and had to be ventilated as a result of respiratory failure. And um, uh, they assessed their brains, right? And they found that at least a part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was detectable within various parts of the brains of these patients, which you know, corroborates past findings. So to quote um, Dr. Kyla um, Bilgavar, an associate professor at Yale, quote, our study clearly demonstrates that neurons can become a target of SARS-CoV-2 infection with the devastating consequences of localized ischemia in the brain and cell death. Our results suggest that neurologic symptoms associated with COVID-19 may be related to these consequences and may help guide rational approaches to the treatment of COVID-19 patients with neuronal disorders. Okay, and then Akiko Iwasaki, um, who is a professor, very senior professor in the Department of Immunobiology and Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology at Yale, pretty big department. Uh, she was quoted as saying, quote, uh, future studies will be needed to investigate what might predispose some patients to the infections of the central nervous system and to determine the route of SARS-CoV-2 invasion in the brain. Okay, so, so what does this all mean? So first, this really isn't a virus you want to catch, <laughs> right, if you can avoid it. You know, it doesn't seem like everybody is susceptible to these neurological symptoms. There's a fair bit of accumulating evidence that at least some people are susceptible to having the virus infect neurons in the central nervous system. It also proposes a possible mechanism for how it is that the virus might cause neurons to ultimately die. So basically, by infecting neurons, it creates a local environment and modifies the um, local environment within the brain that's devoid of specific or, or um, sufficient nutrients surrounding neurons, right? And so, you know, ultimately, that ends up starving those, those neurons of the nutrients they need to survive. And so, you know, I don't think that we can be like entirely confident that this is the definitive mechanism. But the study certainly suggests that it's the case, and it would absolutely make sense given just how, how general and indirect a mechanism it is. Like, it's still not a direct mechanism of, like, the virus directly infecting neurons. Rather, it's, it's a it's sort of secondary consequence of infection. Um, so the, tech, the takeaway here, keep wearing your masks <laughs> until and after you get your vaccine. Anybody telling you that you no longer need to wear a mask after you're vaccinated, they're just wrong, and it's irresponsible. Um, and and uh, asinine, uh, particularly people who have medical training uh, to, to be making that suggestion. My parents got their first vaccine uh, a few days ago, by the way. Um, well, so, you know, do everything you can to get the vaccine, right? My parents, you know, got their first vaccination a few days ago, and I couldn't be more thrilled about that. And by the way, you know, j just as an aside, they haven't experienced any sufficient or significant side effects, right? Um, and I suppose that's not particularly surprising, given that, you know, from the data that we have from the trials of, of, the, of both vaccines, um, although I think it was particularly the Moderna, the Moderna vaccine, which is the one that they got, um, it seemed that younger people tended to experience side effects more frequently with the vaccine that they received 
Um, but you know, regardless, it, it's it's encouraging that you know my parents didn't have any side effects from from the vaccine. So, anyways, um, good luck. Um, I hope everybody stays uh, healthy and you know relatively sane uh, until we can all get our vaccines, uh, which is coming soon. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Knocking on wood, fingers and toes crossed. So uh, let's start the live half. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I have a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania. And just now on YouTube, I talked about a study that just came out, basically, um, that explored whether um, SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, is capable of infecting neurons, and what the consequences of infection by those neurons are. Um, it, it's a really cool study, and I sort of got into the nitty-gritty details of, of at least some of the findings, some of the, the main findings, as well um, as organoids, which are basically like little tiny little brains that are grown in a petri dish. I sort of like just tickled the philosophical questions that people um, can have about organoids. Oops, all right, let's turn that down. Duh. Hello. Hello, Lady Aspen. Oh, my parents live in, um, in Colorado, not in Aspen. Aspen's beautiful. Does it cause breast pain? Does COVID-19 cause breast pain? Um, I have not seen any um, any reports that it causes like specifically breast pain. Um, but you know, I, w I wouldn't put it past this virus. This virus is capable of doing some really weird things, really strange things in in, in different people. So you know, I, I can't tell you no for sure. I can't tell you yes for sure. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised, particularly if, if the breast pain is occurring with other symptoms, right? Um, particularly fi uh, 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 fever. Um, okay, we're getting a call. Awesome. I love it when we get calls. Looks like we're connected. So is your name uh, Andrea? And if that's your name, uh, where are you calling from? Oh, I got the vaccine. You got the vaccine? Yes, I got both doses. That's awesome. Congratulations. How, how, so how long? How long ago did you get it? Um, probably about a week and a half ago was the second dose. The second dose. And so did you experience any, um, like, any sort of unpleasantness uh, at all, or was it yes. just fine? Yes, so for the first one, I felt uh, very flushed, and kind of uh, almost like a fever. Okay. And then the second, second one, um, I had almost like a uh, um, head cold in a way, but without the sniffles, just headache. Okay. Well, yeah, that that's pretty much what's been reported. All right. Well, um, thank. And I'm actually, yeah, I see some of the comments. I'm actually a trans woman. Okay. Um, yeah. Don't worry about comments. <laughs> uh, it's just the internet. Um, okay. Well, that's interesting. So, but but now you feel pretty much fine. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Um, I, hopefully, uh, more of us will uh, get it. Again? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, as soon as I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it seems pretty well. Um, I hope that it works. I'm, not, I'm curious about the different strands. Um, if that's going to, you know, it should be able to fight off and prevent those proteins from, uh, you know, getting us sick. Yeah, so the, pretty much what we understand about um, the, the various differences of the strains, the vast majority, that there would be no reason to believe that the vaccine, the, any of the vaccines would be any less effective because of the, the um, mutations. There is one that I've seen some um, physician scientists in the UK, I, I believe the this, um, South Africa strain, that does seem to be pretty substantially different. Um, and so there's some possibility that, you know, the vaccines will be, you know, somewhat less effective. But but we don't know that for sure, and, and you know, okay. in all likelihood, they'll be it'll be just as effective. Somebody I just saw my wife was. All right. <laughs> um, by the way, so so the the really cool thing about those vaccines is um, how rapidly we can change them. So um, you know, it's this has been sort of underreported, but. The, um, the mRNA-based vaccines that were developed here in the United States, they were literally, like, the basics of their development occurred over a weekend in January, right? So literally just a couple of days, and we had, um, uh, we had like, you know, a, a, 
of course, we had to go undergo train or, or um, testing and, and safety evaluations. That's all the responsible thing to do. But what that means is that, OK, let's say we find out that this South African uh, variant or, you know, there's a couple that there's, the, you know, the Kent variant from the United Kingdom that has been detected here in the United States. It's probably been here for a pretty long time since the, we've been doing such a, an atrocious job of genetic surveillance. Hopefully that'll begin to, to get a lot better. Um, but, you know, uh, 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 if if it turns out that you know and, and this Kent strain is supposedly quite a bit more contagious easier to spread um, but uh, if it turns out that uh, you know the, the vaccines aren't as effective as we would like we can just change them in a, in a weekend you know um, and that's true also for the the United the the, the Oxford AstraZeneca virus uh, it is a virus but it's it's a vaccine it's a modified virus uh, they can change that really really rapidly too um, and so so that we can be very very nimble when it comes to these vaccines regardless of, of any kind of strange um, uh, uh, mutations or, or variants um, okay we continue your program on YouTube when Periscope ends. Yes, Sapphire Song. In fact, I am live right now on YouTube, and I just talked about a study that came out. YouTube.com slash Anthropoid. You can also get to, um, hey, hello, Nora. You can also get to my YouTube page through my profile on um, Periscope. I just talked about um, some studies that were done, or some experiments that were done, to evaluate whether or not SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes coronavirus, or, or COVID-19, um, is capable of infecting neurons. Um, and uh, uh, so you can check that out, youtube.com slash anthropoid. Um, okay. So it looks like we're getting another call. Okay. Uh, looks like we're connected. Uh, Secularist, uh, uh, remind me, what's your name and where are you calling from? Um, uh, as you remember me, I'm, I'm Jassim. I'm from Los Angeles, Venice Beach. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy with the dysfunctional the prefrontal you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I understand. Okay, so so what's on your mind, man? Uh, so, um, so I did a lot of reading on, on neuroscience, and uh, I found this syndrome. It's called, uh, I think you've heard of it. Uh, it's called Callisto syndrome. You've heard of it? Uh, I, it, it is ringing a, a very vague bell, but but no, you, you remind me. So, a uh, Callisto syndrome. So, uh, 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 as we know, obviously, uh, the, the brain is composed of two hemispheres, right? The, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Oh. And so what Kalisol syndrome basically is, is that uh, the part of your brain that, that makes sure that the, both hemispheres are connected, uh, the, the corpus callosum, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Cor it's, it's, corpus called, it's pronounced corpus callosum. And yeah, it, it is like a very, very dense network of fibers that enable one hemisphere of the brain to essentially influence the other hemisphere of the brain. Yeah, exactly. And uh, basically, people who suffer from say, this thing called Kalisol syndrome, uh, their corpus callosum it's not functioning it's either badly damaged or it's not working and because of this because uh, both their hemispheres are disconnected uh, they're not able to communicate properly and you end up uh, with a dual consciousness where you have like two people living in the same brain like uh, you yeah that, yeah so so that that's interesting i mean um so so you know this this kind of a syndrome can arise for a variety of reasons um you know just to give you an example, like um, there are some uh, uh, epilepsy patients who have very, very severe epilepsy for whom no treatments are working. And so the only strat, the only solution is surgical. So uh, and one way, one thing that has been done is literally severing the corpus callosum, which basically prevents the emergence of a seizure to spread throughout the brain, which can be quite dangerous. Um, there are some really, really interesting videos that you can watch, actually, some of which were done, I, I believe, by Oliver Sacks. Um, with these what are called split brain patients um, and you know it, it there's some really amazing things like like um just to give you you know a, a more practical tangible tangible example if you are to show a picture of let's say a puppy right and you're 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 preventing both eyes from seeing it only one eye can see it right and um, I believe it must be the right eye I, I'm not 100 percent sure but basically if you prevent both eyes from seeing it and the corpus callosum is severed um, they basically they can see it they, they can see this picture but they fail to be able to tell you what it is or explain what it is um it's really really odd to to, to watch but anyway so so what makes you feel like do, how, do you believe that this is is relevant to your experience uh not necessarily no it's just i watched so many uh, interesting videos about it and basically what they found was that um it actually might explain why people suffer from this thing uh, you've heard of it it's a disassociative identity disorder yeah so they, they use this syndrome to possibly explain why many people have like 
multiple personality, personalities living in their same head. And uh, have you watched the movie with uh, James McAvoy called Split? Called have what? Uh, there's this movie called um, it, uh, it's, it stars James McAvoy. It's called Split. Split? Uh, no, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, basically, it's, it's made by M. Night Shyamalan. Huh. And uh, what it's about? It's about uh, a patient named uh, Kevin Crumb, who is played by James McAvoy, and he has 24 different personalities living in his head. Wow. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, so, you know, uh, split personality or multiple personality disorder is um, is sort of a contentious topic, actually, within biomedical science. There are definitely physicians who don't actually believe that it exists, like, in the way that it's popularly conceived. But there are also physicians who are adamant that it is for real, that it happens. Um, and so, you know, just so you know, it, it's not like, you know, uh, diabetes, where, like, everybody's on the same page. We're like, that's definitely a thing. Um, but anyways, yeah, so have you seen the movie? Yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've definitely, I, I recall reading about that. I, I, not, not so much that, um, not as severe as like, um, you know, uh, an insulin deficiency being completely abolished um, upon, you know, um, uh, a switch there, but more like, like the hormonal levels can be completely radically different. Um, of course, insulin is a hormone, but like um, if there's like an underlying pathology that's causing diabetes, I haven't seen that that would be, you know, um, corrected, let's say, by, by a, a separate, you know, identity. But um uh, but yeah, like like you know, completely different levels of like you know glucocorticoids, like cortisol and stuff like that. But listen, that sounds uh, really interesting. I I am definitely going to be checking that out. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, recommending. Yeah, just just write that down. And uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to you know keep you up to date with on it since uh, it, it's a very interesting type of syndrome. Like uh, I, I watched this one video. Well, it's from the 1990s where they did an experiment with someone who suffered from from Callahan syndrome and like. Basically, like one side of his brain uh, was, let's say, an artist, and the other side of his brain wanted to be a scientist. And one side of his brain uh, was an atheist, and the other side of his brain was a Christian. Huh. Is, and, well, yeah. And uh, I even watched this video. It, it, my jaw dropped on the floor. Like uh, there was this uh, guy who had Collison syndrome. Uh, he ended up he he like hit his wife. He like touched her very violently, mm. and then his left hand came in and pulled his right hand away. Ah, uh, yeah, right, right. Well, Interesting, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, and uh, stay safe. Let's uh, let's talk again. All right. All right. Take stay it around. easy, Jason. All right. Um, let's see. Where? Why is this? Hello. Oh no! It looks like I lost you, Michelle. If if you're still around, I would love um, for you to um, call back in. Um, sorry, I missed you. I apologize for that. Um, Michelle is um, looks like a, a physician, um, and she wants to comment on the vaccine. So I would appreciate it if you could call in. Um, okay, so um, no halves today. So yes, um, uh, uh, you know what, Peregrine Took? I actually played Lord of the Rings in the background last night. <laughs> uh, kind of funny. Anyways, um, so haps, what our, our friend Perry is... Um, is referring to is a platform, a new platform, very new platform, HAPPS.TV, which is essentially like like a kind of more sophisticated, <laughs> like it has a lot more tools than um, Periscope does, and um, and and it, it has a lot of really good features that sort of support live interaction. So I also have a profile over there, and I've been using it, and I really like the community. I really like the philosophy behind the um, the platform. So you can check it out. I have a link in my profile. Um, but it's haps.tv, H-A-P-P-S.tv. Um, all right. Uh, oh, too bad. He's a doctor. Um, what's wrong with different personalities? Aren't we supposed to have different personalities? I just want to say hi online. Connect me, please. Are you calling in? Okay. Let's do this. This is very, very awkward. Okay. Well, we're getting a call. I don't know if it's the same person. But it looks like um, Theodore. Is that your name? And if so, where are you calling from? Yeah, oh, Jenny, I guess. Is, is your name Jenny? Yeah, I'm Jenny. 
Okay. Theodore's my dog's name. Ah, okay. Uh, so, so where are you calling from? South Carolina. Oh, cool. Okay, what's on your mind? Oh, I was going to tell you about the vaccine. Oh, oh please do. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so th- this is this is like a, like a, um, referring to uh, people. Generally speaking, these are, these are um, people who have been severely traumatized, um, and it, it, it becomes an almost pathological. Um, it's not like a, a having a versatile personality, um, but but anyways, it, that that is a fair argument. That that is a you know that is an argument that physicians make, where it's like this is you know when we when somebody is um, identified as you know having this condition, um, it's just that they are very there. It's it's such a more severe manifestation of, a, of an otherwise natural kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that there, there's, it's a fair argument uh, that, that occurs. But anyways, uh, so what's up? Um, well, my husband got the vaccine, and he was very, very sore for many days. Mm. And um, he's, he's a doctor here. Um, it's been pretty tough. He's an emergency room doctor. And it's uh, been, it's been, and I'm in the medical field, too, but I haven't been working. I'm afraid to go back to work. I don't blame you. You know? Do, do you know... Um, do you know which vaccine he got? I don't know. I can ask him. No, it's okay. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, I was just curious. Okay. Uh, uh, but, you know, I probably had COVID, and I, I think I went crazy for a while. Like, my, I was just... I, there is such a thing as COVID brain, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you say COVID. Like, you know, there, there are definitely some patients, a subset, a minority of patients, who present actually primarily with what are like typically neurological symptoms like stroke confusion like what appears almost like dementia um and then generally speaking those oh and then of course the sort of infamous anosmia or the loss of the ability to of of the sense of smell um but generally speaking then you know the symptoms progress and people develop fevers and and the sort of more standard you know COVID 19 kind of repertoire of symptoms but um but so 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 yeah i mean well what makes you feel like that, like your, your bout of, of this uh, uh, symptom had anything to do with COVID-19? Because, well, I went to Disney World. Oh, okay. And I, did, I, I was just bold, and I started to dance. And, and um, because, you know, my world was falling apart, and I got escorted out by security. I mean, who gets escorted out by security for dancing at Disney World? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Huh. Um, I was just that there's just been a lot of trauma and death, you know. Yeah. And I thought, well, I can go to Disney World and be happy. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it out okay. It sounds like you're you're doing fine now. Um, I did my taste buds changed, but my perception changed. Like, um, I feel like I'm starting to come back down, but I I, I feel like. Hmm. And my taste buds changed. Everything, you know, I had all the uh, the regular symptoms, but but I I know I'm not the same person I used to be. Huh. I'm sorry to hear that. No, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that would put you in the minority of people who would consider it to be a good thing. But hey, you know, silver lining. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't I can't sleep very well. That's one hmm. thing. No, That's I don't. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble with uh, sleeping. And that's new? Not new, no. Just, I wake up, like, in sweats. Hmm. Um, uh, and then my anxiety has gotten a lot worse. Hmm. Have you and been, I, have you been evaluated by a physician? I went to my doctor and thought I was crazy. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> huh, uh. It, it, did, He's my friend too, so it doesn't help. Oh. Uh, like, yeah. I see. I mean, what, what are they going to say? They're going to agree with you until you're crazy, you know? But my anxiety has gotten really, like, I'm almost like a little, well, I guess when you've had a lot of deaths in the family, I guess that's normal. And and I wasn't joking about, like, um, like left breast pain. Mm, okay. I mean, I'm not joking about that. I don't know if that has something to do with the connective tissues or something. Uh, I mean, it, it's not something I've seen reported. I, so here's—I'm well, purely speculating here—but I, I could imagine there being some kind of inflammatory reaction, or, 
or even endocrine reaction um, that, you know, have you been evaluated for lumps and stuff like that? My husband's, my husband's has done evaluated. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm telling you, I have no filter anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably just. <laughs> well, uh, you sound, you seem very delightful, uh, but um, that, there is evidence. So, so, you know, on YouTube, youtube.com slash antipode, I did just talk about um, a study that was published like maybe two days ago or so that showed that um, SARS CoV 2, the, the virus that causes COVID 19, is capable of infecting neurons. Um, and is capable of inducing normal cell death, not necessarily directly by the virus, but by altering the environment within the brain that then can cause normal cell death. Um, but, you know, ha have you had any kind of like antibody tests? Like, has anybody tested if you have antibodies against um, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2? No, I mean, there's no point. He comes, he comes home. There's, it's just no point. I mean, of course, we've had it or we're going to get it because he's, he, he's an amidst of it, you know? Mm -hmm. He yeah. even said there's no way none of us yeah. Um, I think I'm more impulsive, and uh, mm. definitely I don't know. It's almost like I've been in like in sort of a dream state, mm. like an altered state of consciousness. And so, have you seen a psychiatrist? No, there's nothing wrong with me. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything wrong with you, but you know, uh, if if you know, if here's it, let's just say if you were like my sister, right, in my family. I would definitely make the same recommendation just so you get a, get a sense of what's going on. And, and you know, maybe it's, it's totally unrelated to COVID-19 and hey, maybe it's totally benign and whatever, you're just you know, continuing to mature and, and change as, as you age, right? Uh, but maybe it's something else and you, know, you just wanna make sure you it's catch it. It's definitely not psychosis. Uh, okay. It's not. It's been stress and a lot of death in the family. Um, there's been a lot of things that have Yeah, I know. No, something on here just said psychosis. You mm. know what? That's rude. Well, it's not necessarily rude. I mean, if psychosis is extremely yeah. common. Um, it, it, I, I was surprised to, to, to learn that like something like a third of people, at least, it will experience psychosis at least one time in their life. But anyways, you know, listen, Jenny, it, you seem very lovely to me, and you seem like you're doing just fine, but, um, you know, if you were in my family, I would absolutely recommend that, you know, you just check it out. You, you know, maybe it's totally fine, and who cares? And, you know, what well, couldn't hurt? Have, listen, if you were in the Middle Ages and people were dying around you, of like, course. from the bubonic plague, would you ask them if they had psychosis? No. Of course not. Of course not. No, that that's totally understandable. Absolutely understandable. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at that. And this is pretty well, and I'm not psychotic. And this is all, all this loss of life um, is due to COVID-19? Some, some of it is, some, some of it isn't. Um, uh, my friend's uh, brother was killed in a motorcycle accident. Oh, jeez. Uh, like two weeks ago. So there's just been a whole lot of death. And, and maybe your mind um, goes into the state of shock. I think I've been more in the state of shock, you know. It's certainly understandable. Listen, Jenny, I'm, I'm sorry to hear it. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope... Um, hey, don't worry. It's not your problem. Don't, it's okay. I'll let you carry on. Thank you. All right. Thanks for calling in, Jenny, and, and good luck. Everything will be fine. I agree. Thanks, sir. I hope you're well. I Thank you. Uh, I, you know, we're hanging in there. Uh, it's definitely a small world for a family with a two-year-old daughter, but uh, we're hanging in there. Can't complain. Um, it looks like we're getting another call. Wait, you know what? I should do a couple comments just because. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, condolences. Sorry for your loss. Yes, I agree. Um, okay. I cannot ever get a restful night's sleep. It's horrible. Yeah, you know, my sleep has been very strange, and I've been having very, very vivid dreams lately. Can you shout out my mate Pete uh, Lee Company PJ removals? PJ removals? Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. Where are you going after Periscope? So YouTube and then a platform called Haps, haps.tv. Um, I'm doing well. Thank you, Asha. Um, yes, I mean, we, we cannot complain. Um, we're, we have it much better than a lot of folks do. So um, haps.tv, H-A-P-P-S.tv, -H and uh, you can get find the link in my profile, but then also YouTube, youtube.com slash antipoid, where I talk about a specific topic for like 15, 20 minutes. And... Um, the topic today, and I've talked about everything from like how we have hallucinations, 
um, you know, um, uh, dreams, what dreams are, but, you know, dementia, various treatments for dementia. I was, go I was going to talk about a study that came out um, a couple days ago that demonstrated that people who adhered to a specific diet called the MIND diet or the Mediterranean diet, people who were going to develop Parkinson's disease dramatically delay the onset of, of Parkinson's disease, which is very, very interesting. And it actually had a pretty substantial gender or sex-related um, effect where women were more um, uh, dramatically affected um, by, by, by how long their Parkinson's was delayed. It's a very interesting study. Um, but anyways, yeah, so I talk about that kind of stuff on YouTube, but then on HAPS.TV, we do more of the sort of, well, the plan is to do more sort of live interaction. And what's nice is that it has a bunch of tools that will enable me to like actually include pictures and stuff like that. So um, yeah, you can check both out through my um, profile page. All right, oh wait, uh, one last thing. Um, okay, let's see. So it looks like we're getting a call from a gentleman named Charlie, I assume. Charlie, is that your name? And if so, where are you calling from? Um, good afternoon, um, it is my name, Charlie, and I'm calling from Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania. Oh, cool, okay. So what's on your mind, Charlie? So when when you say um, how how are you associating those two things like like um, what what let, let me ask you this way what precisely do you mean by learning those those traits? So um, at one extreme, I have a picture of total cowardice, and at the other extreme, I have a picture of recklessness. So somewhere between those two lies bravery. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really interesting topic. Um, and I, I do recall you bringing this up. Uh, so, you know, human traits like, like bravery or, or, or courage or, or cowardice, um, they're, they're the byproduct of a whole, like a very diverse constellation of brain regions, but then also life experiences, you know, and, and obviously genetics as well, right? Um, you know, just to give you like an example, let, let's, let's talk about a, a, a related primate, right? Chimpanzees. Um, you know, chimpanzees are also uh, have a, you know, somewhat of a similar kind of social organization. Not not exactly the same as humans. Um, humans are kind of unique among the primates, but you know, it's a competition species where you know mating is only available to some of the male um, chimps, um, and they have a sort of alpha structure where you know there's a dominant chimp, and then uh, as they get older, that dominant chimp is then challenged by another chimp. And then that, if that chimp wins, that chimp becomes the dominant chimp and they get to, to mate a lot. Um, and so it turns out that, um, generally speaking, the dominant chimp will tend to have higher levels of testosterone than the subordinate chimp, subordinate male chimps. Well, I guess the female chimps do, but they're not the ones competing. Um, and, but, and so it, it turns out that if you were to then give one of the subordinate chimps extra testosterone. If you were to you know, increase their testosterone levels to be at or above the dominant chimp, what do you think um, happens when, when, when scientists do that? Um, uh, I assume if you increase testosterone, you increase aggressiveness. That's, that's, a, that's a solid, uh, you're, you're absolutely right about that. But so, so here's, it's kind of um, surprising, and this is why I bring up this, this, um, this example. So um, you, you increase uh, testosterone, right, in a subordinate chimp, you, and you absolutely do observe more aggressive behavior, but you do not see more aggressive behavior against the alpha chimp, right, the, the dominant chimp. You see more aggressive behavior to the chimps that are subordinate to that chimp, right? And so, you know, you see more aggression, but it's not necessarily in a productive way or in a way that would benefit its own reproductive success, right? So it's not necessarily being more courageous, right? It's, it's just being more aggressive. And so, you know, I think that, you know, the reason I bring up this example is that I would submit to you that there are certain aspects of our personalities, of our predispositions that are hardwired, that are, you know, we inherit from our parents essentially. But then those predispositions are all subject to our life experiences. So how were you raised? Were you abused as a child? Did, was your father uh, a horribly aggressive, 
you know, mean, you know, whatever, you know, asshole. <laughs> um, or, you know, was your father, uh, you know, not particularly assertive, not particularly ambitious, um, you know, all of these types. And, and that's just one very, very small example. Like what were your experiences in school? Were you bullied? All this kind of stuff, right? All of that is sort of, it's like water flowing over a, a mountain, right? The mountain determines where the water ultimately ends up, but the water is going to flow down what, you know, the contours of that mountain. And so, um, you know, it, it's courageousness, bravery, it's, it's, it's inevitably going to be a byproduct of life experience influencing and, and, and responding to your predispositions. And so if you, let, let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. So like, if my goal was to try and emulate more brave behavior, be more courageous, what I would probably do is find, you know, uh, people like, people whom I consider to be courageous or, or, you know, admirable in their bravery. Um, or, you know, I would look to literature and, and fiction and, and identify some, you know, traits of characters that I would like to emulate and then just, just try and emulate them. Right. Like that would be my strategy. Um, you know, there's not much you can do about, you know, how much testosterone levels you have, you know, um, uh, circulating. You, you can do a little bit you get enough sleep. You do some resistant exercises, uh, all of that kind of stuff helps, you know, increase testosterone levels. And obviously bravery and courageousness is not just solely a byproduct of testosterone, though I would suspect that it's a pretty important part of it, at least for males. Um, but so you can't really do much about that, right? Unless you want to artificially influence those levels. But what you can do is modify your environment, modify the information, you know, influencing your brain by seeking out, you know, examples of human behavior that you find to be um, uh, worthy of emulation or, or you know, good manifestations of, of bravery. That's, that's what I would do. But I can't tell you specifically, like, you know, you got to do 15 jumping jacks, you have to drink a lot of milk, and you have to, you know, it's like, it's not going to be something that simple. But so, so what do you think? Oh, no. We just lost, lost connection. Well, I mean, fundamentally, I, I, I do agree, right, that you can, you know, human behavior, a lot of human behavior is learned. Arguably, a, a greater proportion of human behavior is learned than is inherited, right, um, genetically. Um, you know, th there are studies, you know, stepping apart, aside of um, or from uh, bravery and courageousness. Depression can be, um, there's evidence that depression can be a learned behavior or a learned trait. Um, and there's actually an ongoing uh, a debate right now in, in neuroscience as to how much depression is genetically transmitted versus environmentally or behaviorally. Um, the same goes, wow, oh, here, here's, here's an interesting um, other example. So schizophrenia. We know that there's a pretty substantial genetic component to schizophrenia, right? Um, we know that, you know, if you have uh, an identical twin uh, who's genetically identical, that's what makes an identical twin identical, um, you know, you have all the same genes. If you have an identical twin who develops schizophrenia, you have a 50% likelihood of developing schizophrenia. It's, it's around that number. If you have a, a, um, a, a you know, a, a fraternal twin, I guess, um, then you have about a 25% chance. If you just have a sibling, it's about 12.5. If you, you know, um, if you have a half sibling, it's something like, you know, whatever, seven or something like that. Um, and then just compared to just some, any random person off, you know, next to you on the street is about one to two percent um but through adoption studies we've ha we've learned that um if a person who is an identical twin is adopted and and they try and never do this anymore but they used to sometimes separate identical twins um and one of them is adopted by um by you know um uh, a family that let's say one of them develops schizophrenia and, the, and uh, so you know that one of them has schizophrenia, right? These are genetically identical individuals. One of them is adopted by a family with no history of schizophrenia or any psychiatric illness whatsoever. But then the other one is, uh, is adopted by um, a family with family members who have schizophrenia. Um, and not necessarily like the parents themselves have schizophrenia, but just a sort of family um, uh, background of schizophrenia. The likelihood that that other twin is gonna get schizophrenia 
just like their sibling did, it goes way higher than it would otherwise. Um, suggesting that in addition to a genetic um, uh, predisposition to schizophrenia that can be inherited, there's an environmental predisposition that can, that can be learned, right? So in other words, um, a condition that is very biological in nature, right? Um, that does have a genetic component to it also has a very meaningful environmental component to it. Schizophrenia is really interesting. Uh, we can learn a lot from it. Like, um, there, there are some really interesting studies. You know, you might remember, um, oh, what are they called? They're called, uh, what are those blots? Those, um, geez, you know, those like blots where they look like butterflies, <laughs> you know? Uh, man, not Mandelbrot. I keep wanting to say Mandelbrot. R uh, R Rorschach. Uh, Rorschach tests. Uh, it turns out that if you give a family, right, who has a family history of schizophrenia, but nobody in the family has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, you will tend to see similar sort of idiosyncratic interpretations of, of Rorschach's. Um, and I say idiosyncratic, like they're, they're sort of, they're thinking in, in a slightly unique way, you know, a way unique to a family that has no, no family history of schizophrenia, but they're doing it in a shared way. So it's almost like enriched interpretations. Um, and so, ugh. and so um, there is, you know, this very important environmental component to it. And so I would suggest to you that, you know, while bravery and courageousness obviously isn't like a pathological state, um, you know, just like schizophrenia, just like depression, just like all these other very complicated human behaviors uh, and conditions, those other traits can also be affected pretty dramatically by the environment. Which, which includes learning, you know, learning from examples and, and stuff like that. Okay, so if you're a scientist, you should know that a cure for a deadly virus can't be that quick. Well, yes, uh, we don't have a cure for the virus. There is no cure for COVID-19. What we have is a vaccine, um, or we have multiple vaccines that also happen to be extraordinarily effective. Um, that is not a cure. So, you know, there will be some people, very, very few people, something like five out of 100 people, who will catch COVID-19 and develop symptoms. There is no, no cure for them. We have treatments, we have essentially palliative treatments to, you know, ventilation, you know, for, for rather severe cases, but, you know, we have various um, drugs that are essentially anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and, you know, but that's pretty much it. So there is no cure. Uh, there is a vaccine, and that's why you should get the vaccine, because you do not want to be in a situation where you have COVID-19 and there's no cure for it. Um, there, thank you for, yeah, Rorschach, yeah, thank you for reminding me. Alcoholic father, son number one becomes an alcoholic, and son, son number two never drinks in his life. Why? Yeah, that is a, that's a great example. Um, definitely addiction has a very, very significant environmental component to it. And, you know, fundamentally, uh, so th there could be a lot going on there. So, um, first of all, we know that there's a very substantial genetic component to addiction, right? Um, and and this, is, this has been demonstrated at multiple levels of biology. Um, you know, for example, you can inherit certain versions of receptors, neurotransmitter receptors, dopamine receptors, uh, um, you know, uh, opioid, mu opioid receptors, um, a variety of them. <clears throat> and uh, we know that if you, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, we know that if you have some of these variants, you're much more likely to um, develop a substance use disorder with any given substance or with, with one or another substance. So that that's genetically transmitted. Um, there's really, that's essentially an immutable, um, um, characteristic of our biology. Um, however, right, th like that is subject to, there, there is as always a gene environment interaction. That's sort of the phrase that we use to, to refer to the interaction between your biology and your environment. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, but so, so when it comes to a family, right, just, you know, you don't inherit all of the genes of your father, right? You inherit approximately half, not quite half, but approximately half. And, um, and so, you know, there's just, it's just as likely that a sibling will have inherited whatever genetic predispositions the father had to alcoholism or addiction as they did not if, if their mother never, you know, developed a substance use disorder. So it could just be, that, you know, by the numbers, you would actually expect that one sibling would inherit that predisposition, whereas one wouldn't. But let's just say they both did inherit the predisposition. Very, very possible. And there's multiple genetic predispositions. It's not just like one receptor is the alcoholism gene. It's not like that. It's a whole combination of them. Um, you know, so you, let's just imagine that both both of the siblings did inherit it. Well, then that's when the environment comes into comes into play. Where was one sibling horribly abused by their father while the father was drunk, 
um, whereas the other one wasn't. The other one was too young or maybe too old or, or whatever, and they were just spared that experience. That would have a significant uh, uh, influence on it. And here's another example that doesn't have to do with addiction, but it's essentially the same fundamental dyna dynamic. So there's a, a huge study that was done in New Zealand, I think I talked about this last week, that basically was interested in trying to identify a, a depression gene, right? A genetic basis for depression. And um, you know they scanned a whole bunch of, of different genes and it turned out that the one that they, they identified as, as most commonly exhibit or, or um, uh, um, uh, present in people who exhibit depression were uh, related to serotonin signaling. Hey, perfect, we totally, that makes sense. Finally, something in neuroscience that makes sense. Uh, but it turned out that this gene alone did not predict whether or not somebody would develop depression. It wasn't enough, right? Rather, what did predict whether or not somebody would have depression is if they both had that version of that serotonin-related gene and were experienced some kind of childhood trauma. If you had both of those things, two hits, um, then you were much. Then they could predict if somebody would develop depression. Same type of thing, right? So there is this predisposition that that somebody has, and you wouldn't even know it's there unless a certain event in the environment triggers the manifestation of that predisposition, right? So, you know, in the absence of, you know, put it this way, you can inherit a predisposition to opioid addiction or nicotine addiction or alcohol addiction. But if you are never exposed to those substances, you wouldn't even know it, right? Um, now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because oftentimes these predispositions come in sort of buckets, right? Where if, if you're predisposed to, let's say, addiction, you also may be predisposed to ADHD or, you know, various other, um, you know, just various other uh, psychiatric conditions. Not necessarily, but they, they tend to sort of come together because all of these systems influence one another, of course. But, you know, fundamentally, is somebody gonna develop a nicotine addiction if they've never experienced nicotine? No, <laughs> right? So similar type of environmental exposure. Um, oh, oh, there's, okay, people uh, chatting on YouTube. Thank you for the comments, everybody. YouTube.com slash anthropoid. Um, hey, and good to see you. Not sure if it's me, but the volume is quite low, very low, uh-oh. I'm sorry about that. Let's, maybe this will help. Boom. Toast. Okay. Uh, are you planning on getting the vaccine when you are eligible to get it? I am planning on getting the vaccine the moment I can get it. I've, I've registered for the vaccine in Pennsylvania, although it, it, it's not quite registering really. Uh, and I've also registered in New Jersey, which is where I work. Um, and, uh, you know, my family were in essentially the lowest risk category. Not quite the lowest, um, but pretty close. My wife and I are fortunate to be healthy. We're both relatively young, in our 30s. Um, we have a daughter, so that does sort of influence probably our, our sequencing. But, um, but you know, the only other um, option that I might have is through my work, which is for the state of New Jersey, uh, the New Jersey legislature in particular. And so it might be the case that, you know, um, because I'm technically working with, for the state, I might uh, uh, be able to get it a little bit earlier, which, you know, if I can, I will get it. And I don't care if it's the Moderna vaccine, I don't care if it's the Pfizer vaccine. Just give me the vaccine. It is absurd how few people have been vaccinated in this country so far. It is absurd. It's embarrassing. And it is a failure. It's a, it's a failure of government, flat out. There, there, it's a failure. It, yeah, don't get me started. But anyways, yeah, I, uh, I am going to get it as soon as I possibly, possibly can. What comments is he reading uh, on what platform? I checked Periscope and Haps and I don't see him live. Oh, really? Well, I'm on Periscope, but I, I'm not on Haps. So Sundays will are... are um, for now, at least, going to be exclusive to uh, YouTube and, and um, Periscope. <laughs> um, I think I missed the point of your question. He's live on, on Periscope and YouTube. Oh, thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. Uh, interesting. I haven't used Periscope. Oh, okay. Um, I thought I'm on Periscope since he started, and I don't see him live right now. Weird. That, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure they've just abandoned servicing the platform, which is very frustrating. Um, Really interesting how big of an impact your environment can have on you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know what's funny is, so I, you know, I did my PhD to try and map out the neurobiology of um, anxiety and addiction, particularly anxiety and addiction. <laughs> and um, generally speaking, um, compared to people outside of neuroscience, I think I tend to think that the environment, um, that, that genetics plays a more significant role in human behavior than people outside of the discipline. But relative to people inside of the discipline, I think I, I tend to think that the environment plays a greater role than they do in human behavior. Uh, so I'm sort of in this kind of nebulous middle liminal zone. Um, all right. Oh, Ian, you will break my heart. <laughs> uh, okay. Break your heart for what? Um, don't do this to your daughter. Are you talking about the vaccine? 
Um, well, she can't. She's not going to be vaccinated. I mean, I, it, it hasn't been tested in, in uh, babies. Um, so, I mean, she couldn't get vaccinated if I wanted her to. But if she can get vaccinated, if it's demonstrated to be safe, you better believe she's going to get vaccinated. If you think that, the, that any possible theoretical risk of a vaccine is greater than the risk, the developmental risk of a child that's infected with a virus that we barely understand, and I just talked about on YouTube, youtube.com slash anthropoid, I just talked about new evidence that shows that the virus can infect neurons and can induce neuronal cell death. Her brain is going to be developing for another 20 plus years. Um, so, um, so, you know, the notion, and it is true that, that children don't tend to respond as severely to SARS-CoV-2, to COVID-19, that as adults, relative to adults. Wow, it's so weird. Um, but that doesn't mean that, we, that, that they have no reaction whatsoever. It just means that they're, they're, they exhibit fewer symptoms or less severe symptoms. And it's worth noting that some children do die as a result of COVID-19. So, um, yeah, th there is no question that um, there there is no question that you do not want to get this virus. Like it, it is, um, we 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 don't understand it completely. It's only been around for it's been around for less than a year. What we do understand is remarkable. We understand so much in such a short time. It's a testament to science, uh, to biomedical science in particular. But um, uh, but there's still plenty that we don't understand. It just hasn't been around for very long. And so, you know, if, if you think that it's possible that, you know, and, and I could come up with, with explanations for why you might want to, why you might be a little reticent. And, and you know, that, that's, a, that's fine. Like scientists ha, uh, have, have um, um, you know, expressed some concern about how rapidly it was developed uh, or they were developed. But the short story, I'm happy to go into why you shouldn't worry about that. Um, but the short story is you shouldn't worry about that. <laughs> uh, or, or you, you know, that's not a, that shouldn't be your primary concern about these vaccines. Your primary concern should be, when can I get this vaccine? <laughs> um, all right, as an adoptee, I definitely believe that biology plays a bigger role after meeting my, my eight half siblings. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What about 20 years? So, so, you know, the human brain, um, develop it continues developing well on into your mid 20s a little bit um uh, finishes a little bit earlier in, in females than males a little bit i mean it's it's these are like just differences on the margins here pretty much meaningless um but your most notably your prefrontal cortex which is arguably the most human part of the brain it's like the most uni uniquely human part of the brain and it continues developing until 25 26 around that that time and so who knows what the presence of this virus or the effects of this virus on just neuronal differentiation, neuronal migration, you know, um, might be, you know, it, 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 who knows? Um, excuse me. Um, all right. Um, the two shot vaccine seems like the first shot is to test that you won't have problems or die. No, 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 no. That, that's not how it works. So the reason that there are two shots is that, um, and, and not all vaccines have two shots. And by the way, like, I don't know if you've had kids or if you remember when you were a kid, a lot of vaccines have booster doses. Some of them have multiple boost booster doses year after year. Um, and so this is not unusual. People shouldn't be like freaked out about, you know, um, the fact that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines need two doses. That's common. The reason that there are two doses is that the first injection, it does elicit an immune system re response for sure. Like the immune system does respond, but you get a much, much, and you do get protection from just that one dose. So if you can only get, I'm one of the advocates of, if you can only get one dose, just get it. But you, you know, you should want to get two doses because what that second dose does is that it really primes the immune system to very rapidly recognize SARS-CoV-2. And so you have a much, much more effective immune response. And so that's how you get up the, these numbers of protection that are up to like 95%. That is wildly effective. Um, it is like, like superhero stuff, right? Like it's, it's so good. Um, and so that's why we have two doses, just because it's more effective than one. That's why. And who knows, maybe it would be even better if there were three doses, right? But it's such a marginal improvement, 95 to what, 97% efficacy, right? So it's like, just get the two doses. Um, but that's why. It is not to, to evaluate whether or not you're going to die or whether or not it's toxic in you. That is not why we have two, virus, or two um, vaccines. Um, all right. Multiple doses didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. A lot of things didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, the state of medicine 30, 40 years ago, I mean, th like physicians were basically carpenters. <laughs> like nothing against carpenters, but I don't go to a carpenter to get my, you know, uh, diabetes diagnosed or my, you know, autism evaluated, right? 
um, vaccinology, virology, um, you know, were so much more primitive 30 or 40 years ago. Now we know more about the immune system. We know more about human biology. We know more about vaccines um, and viruses. And so we have better treatments, right? Um, yeah, Pfizer says first shot only 20%. Right, well, I don't, I don't think it's that low, but yeah, exactly. So you get some protection, better than none. But you, um, but you could get much better protection if you had two vaccines, right? That's, that's the point. Uh, why is the camera so damn? Good Lord. Good Lord, everybody. Whoa, now we're bright, now we're bright. Take it down, pull it down, chill it out. Okay, that's better. Um, you don't wanna get it. Do we want to shut down society because of it? A cost benefit analysis is bare minimum, surely. You don't wanna get it? Well, but if we, get, if we all get vaccinated, we can open up completely. That doesn't make any sense. All right, um, um, okay. I'm 42, only received min one doses as a babe child. You know, Mona Lisa, I, I would I would suggest that you scrutinize that a little bit more closely. I bet you did get booster shots. But, um, and hey, I'm only 10 years, about 10 years younger than you, actually less, uh, fewer, uh, yeah, less, less years, <laughs> fewer years younger than you, um, fewer than 10. But anyways, um, I got booster, dose, booster shots for sure, absolutely. Hell, I, I got vaccines before I went to grad school. Like, like I, I, when I was in my 20s, I got vaccines. Like, th there is a lot of very, very, like just overt misunderstandings of viruses, of the immune system, of vaccines. That is just wild to me. This virus has brought human society to its knees. It's brought the United States to its knees. And people are still entertaining the notion of not getting the vaccine. It is like, that is what you call natural selection. Like that, that is that is a bad way to think. <laughs> like I, I usually don't get this animated about uh, people, you know, who, who have different views and, and these kinds of things, but I'm sorry, this is just, I, there is literally no good biological explanation. And hey, if you know me, you know I'm wide open to new information. I am ready to change my beliefs, my, my you know, positions in the face of new evidence, but there's none, there is none. And it's dangerous. That's the other thing, right? If we were just talking about whether or not, you know, free will exists, I wouldn't care so much, right? Because it's not really going to affect your life all that much, um, unless you're in criminal justice. But I'm sorry, there's just no evidence. And every single argument I've seen is based on a misunderstanding. Every single one. Um, okay. What is your estimation on going back to normal worldwide? I think, you know, um, I think it, it, it completely depends. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm also not a physician. Um, but I can tell you this for sure. The faster everybody gets vaccinated, the faster we reopen. <laughs> like, it's just a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, I wish we did take the natural selection route. There have been lockdowns if we did. It's not logical to take any food or medicine that has only been studied for eight months. What? It's not logical to take any food that's only been studied. But by that principle, you would never eat anything new right like you would never try a new food that was just made in a restaurant like for the first time last week you would never go to a restaurant opening like and we've studied vaccines for decades and decades decades and decades over a century right we know a lot about this biology don't do not trick yourself into thinking that you know just because okay let's talk about this let's talk about this so one of the concerns and frankly i also had this concern early on 100%. And I, I literally asked, you know, uh, uh, what is her name? Uh, Lena Wen or whatever, one of the epidemiologists, I think at Yale, literally asked like, hey, okay, scientist to scientist, you know, like, um, is this, is the fact that it's been so expedited, does that cause you any concern? And, you know, uh, it, it's, it caused me concern um, because it is a fair concern that, you know, this has moved so fast relative to typical vaccine production. So first of all, you know, we haven't been greeted by a pandemic virus like this for uh, over 100 years, right? That we know of, right? You know, the, the closest pandemics that, that or the, pand the epidemics that were the closest, actually I talked about the Zika virus, I probably, you, you might not remember, um, you, you couldn't be blamed if you forgot about the Zika virus um, outbreak or pandemic, eh, epidemic, uh, in North, Central, and South America. This was a virus that's spread by mosquitoes. It's kind of similar to the dengue virus. And it turned out that women who were pregnant 
if they're infected, there is a chance that the, the fetus would develop microcephaly, which is basically just a restricted head size, which then therefore in, uh, inevitably restricts the, the growth of the brain. Um, that was the most recent. That was actually 2015, not that long ago. Um, but but it, even it didn't reach the, the scale of COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, right? Um, and so we just haven't had, we haven't been in a position where we really, really need to race to make a vaccine because there is no cure for this virus. There's really very few cures for viruses in general, right? The, the, the evolutionary strategy is vaccines. That is a strategy that humans have come up with to combat one of our fundamental evolutionary adversaries, viruses. And that's our strategy. And we are so lucky to live in an age where we have that at our, at our disposal, where you don't have to worry if, I'm not worried if my child is going to develop polio or the measles, right? That would maim her or, or kill her, right? I don't have to wake up with that concern. Um, so, okay, so, so that's just one aspect of it. Like, why is it expedited? Because, why is it so expedited relative to other vaccines? Because we've never really had to do this before, right? And it's really the only solution that we have. Okay, that's one. The number number two is that the the things that the, the components of virus or vaccine production that have been expedited are not components that are associated with safety evaluations, right? If they were, then that would be a cause for concern, but they're not, right? What, what has been expedited is the relationship between uh, uh, invention of the vaccine and then mass production of the vaccine, rather than waiting until. Um, you know, rather than having a, a company essentially foot the bill for phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, right? They, that was subsidized by, by the government. So rather than having the company have to do that and then evaluate, this is a very, very expensive endeavor for a private sector entity. So are we really gonna shell out multiple billions of dollars on a vaccine that we don't know is effective? No, so we're gonna take our time. So usually that's what they would do in the past. But we know that the sooner we all get these, this vaccine, the more rapidly we can return to normal or it's probably never going to be normal again but some version of normal right and so what happened was they invented the vaccines in a weekend right which is amazing it's amazing it also makes sense if you understand mrna uh, how easy it is to manipulate mrna but anyways um and then they essentially almost immediately began production right not 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 technically immediately but very very rapidly and so this this multiple years a delay between the, the um, invention of the vaccine, the safety evaluations, the clinical trials, and then ultimately the production, that would usually take m many years. And it's just the logistics and, and manufacturing. It's not safety evaluations and stuff like that. That whole period has been truncated, right? We just got rid of it because we knew, hey, if it's even remotely effective, we want these vaccines. So that's what's been ex uh, expedited. Another thing is that, um, you know, uh, uh, that these people haven't been vaccinated for all that long, right? And so how can we be sure, blah, blah, blah. How can we be sure that it's safe? Well, we know from all of those decades of vaccin vaccinology, of, of testing vaccines, that generally speaking, if somebody's going to develop a side effect from a vaccine, they're gonna ex uh, exhibit it within a couple days and certainly within two months. It is exceedingly rare that there is some kind of a delayed effect. Um, it's, it's unprecedented that there's a, like a delayed effect that lasts many, many years off into the future. It's usually two months at the max. Right, and so, you, so that's your cost-benefit analysis. Do you want to potentially die from this virus? Do you want to potentially have your nervous system change forever? Right, neurons die, never coming back. Um, do you want to spread this virus to your loved family members? Maybe are a little bit more vulnerable than you are. Maybe not. Some people that are perfectly healthy pass away from COVID-19. Do you want to take that gamble or? Do you want to use one of the only tools in the human toolbox to compete with viruses that we've ever developed that is remarkably effective in the off chance that despite all the safety, the rigorous scrutiny and safety evaluations, I don't know if you can hear my daughter, she's excited to get the vaccine, but um, um, that has been rigorously ass assessed by scientists, uh, tested in tens of thousands of people, large numbers of people that have been tested and avoid killing your family members, maiming yourself, uh, and changing, potentially changing your nervous system for the rest of your life. That's your cost benefit analysis. And I would argue that if you make the first, if you take the first choice, um, your, your survival mechanisms aren't properly calibrated. <laughs> That's how I'll put it. Okay, I'm done, I'm done. Um, 
if COVID uh, was HIV, would they have developed a vaccine just as quick? Well, HIV is a very, is a very different kind of virus. SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. It's, you know, there are other coronaviruses that are out there that, that circulate generally seasonally. You know, they, oftentimes they call basically the cold. You know, it's like four of them that circulate. Every now and then, it seems like about every 10 years, there is a, a variant of a coronavirus that generally emerges from some kind of a reservoir species. And then you have uh, either an outbreak or an epidemic or now a pandemic with, with SARS-CoV-2. So it happened to SARS-1, SARS-CoV-1 uh, in Asia. Then it happened with MERS, Middle Eastern uh, Severe Respiratory Syndrome, uh, in the 2010s. And now it's happening with SARS-CoV-2, okay? Um, but so, so they're, you know, the, these are viruses that are uh, quite a bit more common. And there, there's one key difference. HIV is a, a retrovirus, right? So HIV can integrate into the, the host genome, the host cells genomes. That is a very, very different dynamic than, um, than you know, SARS-CoV-2 or almost essentially any other virus. Um, and so, so it's just, it's far more difficult. It's a far more difficult problem to solve. Also, far fewer people developed HIV and AIDS. Like it, it was horrifying how many people did, how many people were lost, changed this country certainly forever. Uh, but we're seeing COVID-19 at a scale that is way beyond anything else ever in the, in the history of this country, ever. Um, so that that's part of the reason why. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, all right. For you, the solution is to get everyone vaccinated. Yes, most definitely. It would, you know... There, there are more things that we could do, right? Like, hey, if antibody tests were, were widely available, it would be nice if we could all just get be tested for antibodies uh, uh, against COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And then we could know, like, hey, you know what? You don't really need the vaccine right now. What, you know, we need your elderly grandfather or your, you know, your, your uh, mother who has diabetes or whatever. They should probably get the vaccine first because they don't have antibodies. That would be one way that we could, like, you know, um, uh, optimize this process. But it doesn't fundamentally the the tool that humans have no other tool the tool is vaccines uh to fight v viruses that's it that's the one um okay is the eye part of the brain boobe that is a great question uh it might sound ridiculous right that might, that might sound like a completely absurd state that the eye is part of the brain but it sort of is <laughs> um it's not technically obviously it's not inside of the brain right and you know, visual processing, visual you know, deciphering our visual experience that all occurs in the brain, in the occipital lobe, the, vi the visual cortex. About a third of our brain is devoted to visual processing. Really, really, a lo lot of real estate devoted to vision, which makes sense. It is the most useful of our sensory systems in terms of getting an update into in changes uh, in our environment. Right? You're getting updated at the speed of light, or just a little bit slower, because it actually it doesn't get it's not processed at the speed of light. Um, and that's much more rapid than you know smell, chemo sensation, or, or ke uh, chemo reception, where literally molecules are binding receptors in your olfactory system. That gives you an update, right? If you walk into a room and you smell uh, feces, <laughs> you know that there's, hey, there's feces in this room. <laughs> or if you smell rotting food, you know, it, it takes a while because those molecules have to you know diffuse through the air. Uh, and then reach your nose, and then molecules. It's kind of gross if you think about it, particularly the feces one. Let's get that out of our head. But those are little molecules that are going into your nose and binding receptors to let you know that, hey, there's something potentially dangerous in this environment that, that might hurt me. Um, rotting food, you know, things that, that are uh, potentially pathogenic. So, but that's very slow. The next best is um, auditory system, right? Where basically what we're experiencing are vibrations of air molecules propagating through this substrate of air, right? Literally compression waves, air molecules, like what I'm doing right now. I'm speaking, air molecules are being compressed in between me and the microphone. The speaker, whatever, in your headphones or on your device are now are then vibrating at, frequent, at those same frequencies to then push air molecules at specific frequencies that then hit your, uh, hit your, your ear balls. <laughs> uh, sense of touch is very good. Right, uh, but it's it's almost too late if like you're relying on your sense of touch to give you updates in your environment. So vision, that's the one that, that humans evolved to um, to rely most heavily on. Um, so, but there are a couple things about the visual system that are unique relative to to the other sensory systems. Most notably, the eyeballs are what are called immunoprivileged, meaning the immune system has no response, has no power here, has no uh, ability to. Uh, 
or very limited ability to gain access to the eyes. Um, that's the same for the brain, although their recent discoveries have suggested that the immune system does indeed influence the brain in some interesting ways. Um, but so, so there's that. Um, there's also, you know, excuse me, there's also a very direct, you know, the brain is like almost right behind the eyes, right? So it's, it, they're very, very close to each other. Um, uh, and so, yes, um, so you, you can make an argument, right? You can make an argument that the, the eyes are almost like a, like a part of the brain that just sort of, <laughs> just sort of like uh, pushed its way, the, its way out into the outside of the skull. Uh, you can think of it that way. You could also make the argument that no, actually, there is a pretty important distinction between actual brain matter, parenchyma, and our sensory systems. Our sensory systems are by definition external to the brain. The brain has no sensory receptors itself. Um, rather, it relies upon sensory receptors, photoreceptors in the eyes, hair cells in the ears, mechanoreceptors uh, for touch, um, and on and on. The brain relies on those that are outside of the central nervous system to get updates about the environment. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's sort of an, it becomes almost a semantic or, or philosophical um, argument. Um, all right. Um, are there any after effects of having COVID-19 that are beneficial? I have seen none, unless you do not like your sense of smell. You know, <laughs> uh, it, might be, it might make broccoli a little bit easier to eat if you don't like broccoli, but no. No, I, there, this is only bad, and it is bad in ways that are worse than I think people imagine. It is not the flu. I just talked on YouTube, youtube.com slash anthropoid. Actually, this is a topic from YouTube. <laughs> uh, youtube.com slash anthropoid just talked about a study that showed that SARS-CoV-2 is capable of infecting neurons, it's capable of inducing neuronal cell death by an interesting mechanism that I described. Um, and, uh, oh, and it, inf it can influence vasculature within the brain, which may help explain why it is that some people have strokes uh, as, a, as a component of get developing COVID-19. And what's interesting about the strokes is that th there is no evidence of the typical mechanisms by which stro ischemic strokes occur. There's no like blood clotting or anything like that. Rather, it's just, it looks like a stroke, the footprint of a stroke without any of the other stuff that a stroke usually comes along with. So no, you do not want this. You do not want this. Um, is it 100% certain that that's gonna happen to you? Absolutely not. Most people are okay, right? But it's, it's impossible to know for sure, you know? Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think the mechanism uh, behind the vaccine? Well, we know the mechanism. So um, there is, you know, several different vaccines now. Uh, the main two that we've talked about in at least uh, uh, the United States and in Europe are the Pfizer. The, the main two types of vaccines are mRNA vaccines and a modified uh, adenovirus, a modified virus vaccine. So Pfizer and Moderna, um, Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna their vaccine is mRNA. So basically what you're literally doing is you're encapsulating mRNA, which for, you know, to review intro bio, you have your genome that is in DNA. DNA is transcribed to RNA and then RNA is translated to amino acids, which are then folded into proteins. Okay. And so you're not being injected with DNA. You're being injected with RNA. Um, so it's not modifying your genome. It's not doing anything like that. Rather the cells that are in your shoulder, literally the cells in your shoulder, um, are, 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 intro, are introduced to these little, essentially fatty water balloons with mRNA inside. That's basically what they are. They're called lipid nanoparticles, but they're basically just like little balls of fat. <laughs> That's basically what they are. And cells can take up those little balls of fat. And so then the mRNA gets out into the inside of cells. And then the same exact machines inside of cells that, 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 that express your muscle proteins, right? The same enzymes and polymerases and all of these things, they encounter this mRNA, and like they would with any other mRNA, they translate it. They turn it into protein. And the protein, the sequence for the mRNA that, that is included is a sequence of the spike protein, the protein um, of, here, I'll put it up on YouTube. The, on YouTube, you can see the little sort of blue blobs uh, on the outside of the center ball. That's a spike protein. It's like a sort of like a stool, you can think of it. It's a three-part protein. Um, and so that is the thing that the virus relies upon to get into cells to infect them. Without that, cannot get into cells and infect them, okay? Um, and so what happens is that now your cells are producing this protein, this, this spike protein, disassociated from the viral particles, so you can't be infected, right? 
and it's just in this local area in the immune system your immune system is constantly surveilling your body is there something foreign in the body is there some is there a cell that's behaving oddly that's 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 you know uh, uh doing something it shouldn't it, it that's rapidly dividing to give you a tangible example and so the immune system sees this protein and, and recognizes it as foreign generates antibodies against it and I can tell you the specific sequence of events. I mean, a phagocyte or like a, like a macrophage will uh, encounter this protein, engulf it, and then ultimately display it on the surface of the macrophage and then migrate to germinal centers and to the thymus gland to, to ultimately generate B cells and T cells. And B cells can generate just antibodies. T cells can include killer T cells. And so with all of those, that's your armamentarium, that, or that's your army. Right? You have foot soldiers, you have Marines, you have, you know, uh, uh, pilots, you know, right? And with all of that, with that army, then your immune system attacks anything that looks like it has this protein on it. And because we don't have that protein naturally in our body, it's not going to attack any other part of our body, right? It's not going to attack any of our cells because our cells don't make the spike protein. What does make the spike protein is SARS-CoV-2. And so rather than uh, waiting for, after you're infected, for your cells to churn out more SARS-CoV-2, right? That's how viruses replicate. They replicate themselves within your cells and then essentially kill those cells and pop out, you know, multiplying. Then, you know, if you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, the process is essentially the same. A macrophage will then encounter the whole SARS-CoV-2 viral particle, engulf it, chop it up, display antibodies. Uh, or I'm sorry, display them on the surface and then antibodies are created. Um, and uh, that takes weeks and weeks and weeks and potentially it never happens, right? And part of the problem is that if you're infected with the virus rather than um, given this vaccine, what you have is an innate immune response first. That is like the first, that's, those are like police officers, right? Rather than like an army, right? They, they notice something aberrant is going on and they respond rapidly. Right, but they don't have all the tools. They don't have all the tools that, that the military has. They're not as highly trained. Blah blah blah. Um, and so, so, but that innate immune reaction—that is when things like the cytokine storm that you've heard, you might have heard about, occur, where basically your immune system is like carpet bombing your entire body, just because uh, it encountered this virus. And, and this virus elicits such a severe immune response. So you have to go through that. You have to survive that. And then your, but then that's called your innate immunity, your primary immunity. It's non-specific. It attacks anything that's foreign. Okay. Then, after some time has passed, then you develop a secondary or acquired immunity. Those are B cells and T cells. Okay, and so that process would take weeks and weeks and weeks if you um, were doing, if you were getting it, uh, or if it were occurring, in, um, initiated by the viral particles themselves. With the vaccine, you can skip that whole pr first part, right? And you'll have a, a slight immune reaction. That's why some people have side effects. Interestingly, it's mostly young people that that have. Uh, 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 immune-related side effects, um, and they're you know by and by and large very not nearly severe enough, um, or not nearly severe enough to be concerned. Anyways, um, so but then your your acquired immunity recognizes this spike protein, and therefore the moment that anything that any of these nasty little viral particles that have this spike protein gets into your body, your 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 acquired immunity you already have troops stationed throughout the body ready to attack okay all right <laughs> sorry that's the mechanism oh okay it's difference between that and oxford astrazeneca oxford oxford astrazeneca vaccine totally different platform it is a modified virus it's a it's a chimpanzee uh, uh, adenovirus chad ox it's like the, the funniest most like extremely online name for for a vaccine i've ever heard but anyways it so rather than just using mrna what they're literally ha using is a different virus to fight this virus, right? It's like fire. It's like fighting fire with fire, but the virus that they're using in the in the uh, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca virus is very well tolerated. It doesn't hurt you, um, and so it's not dangerous. Uh, so, but you the, and then ultimately, so so that virus or that virus, and and it's also replication incompetent, meaning that it doesn't replicate the way that natural viruses do, uh, the way that SARS-CoV-2 does, where it replicates, replicates, and and proliferates. Chad Ox just infects some cells locally. I think it is the shoulder, and the same. Ultimately, the same thing happens where, um, through slightly different mechanisms, the virus itself produces those proteins that then are recognized. All right. News stated third strain in Michigan. Yeah, there, there are new strains now. 
in the United States. And frankly, they've probably been here for a while. They've probably been here for much longer than we think, just because as is the case with essentially every single component, except for the vaccine production and discovery, has been a failure. Uh, and that, that has been genetic surveillance. We, okay, we call this country, like in biomedical science, you know, sometimes people say like uh, about Idaho or Wisconsin, there are more cows than people in those states because they produce so much, you know, there's so much agriculture there. In the United States, there's more PCR thermocyclers in this country than there are scientists who know how to run them, right? That's, that's the tool, that is the, the technology that you use to, to test for changes in strains of, of the coronavirus. There, there's no reason that, so, like somebody should have asked me to come help do that, right? Like I can run thermocyclers. I'm happy to take a shift, take a four hour shift, whatever, at the lab, happy to do it so that we would know the second that there's a new strain, but it has not happened. We're not doing it nearly as, mu nearly as much as the United Kingdom is doing it. And, that, and because the United Kingdom is doing it so much more regularly, they were the first. They were the first to identify this strain. That's why. It's probably been here for just as long. Um, you would agree that COVID vaccines are experimental, not tested on animals, right? Um, I don't know if they did preclinical trials. They're, they're no longer experimental though. I mean, they're just not. All those, you know, that, well, they're experimental insofar as any medical treatment is experimental, right? Like that, that's it. Like, like uh, you know, the tests that are done to determine if something is safe have been done with these vaccines. Put it that way. If you still consider that to be experimental, fine. I don't really care. That's an issue of semantics. But there's, there's no reason to suspect that this is any less tested than any other, uh, any other medical treatment. And it's medicine. Medicine is messy, right? Okay. Are mRNA vaccines better in uh, any ways than other types of vaccines? Oh, Javier, good to see you, man. Javier sleeps. It looks like you changed your, your name. Um, I think you changed your name. Anyways, um, are they better? So, no. I mean, are they more effective? I have not seen any evidence that they are. The, the, the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, I believe, had an efficacy of around, of like just north of 90%, uh, which is uh, very, very, very high. And, and unfortunately, there was like some little uh, snafu about how uh, I, I believe the, va the vaccine was tested in Brazil. Like, I think some folks received like a half dose or something like that, that, that weren't supposed to, whatever, doesn't matter. It was tested for safety as well. And um, um, so, and, and then the numbers for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, those are the mRNA vaccines, they're around 95%. So frankly, with, with you know, uh, uh, with um, um, you know standard deviation, whatever standard error, it's probably about the same. They're both very, very, very effective. Here are the the strategic differences between an mRNA vaccine and a let's say virus-based replication incompetent virus-based vaccine. Well, both of them are much, much, much better than the sort of traditional route of inactivated viral particles, where basically you get some of the virus, purify it, and then you just like zap them essentially you heat and activate them you irradiate them you make it so that the viruses themselves are no longer living viruses aren't sort of a philosophical debate as to whether or not viruses are actually technically living but um, they're no longer capable of replicating and so basically you're just introducing the body to a bunch of the little parts of you know it's sort of like like if you were to try and train somebody to recognize um, a car okay and what you did, but you didn't want them to drive it. <laughs> but you did is you just chopped up the car into parts. And so you would see a rear view mirror, you would see the, you know, um, uh, the steering wheel, you would see a wheel, right, or a tire, you would see a hood, you'd see an engine. They're all sort of broken up. But if you were, you know, so you don't see it assembled. But then if you were to look at another car, you'd be like, hey, I've seen a wheel before. I've seen a steering wheel before. This must be a car. So that's like the, the sort of traditional route of, of vaccination. That takes forever. And, and, you know, there are some potential risks. Um, with these, the, the advantage, and people are bringing up the strains, here's the advantage. Uh, it is true, just like every virus in the world, SARS-CoV-2 mutates. And um, it doesn't mutate as much as other viruses can, like the influenza virus, but it mutates. And we're now seeing variants that may or may not probably do have some functional differences, uh, particularly in terms of how contagious they are. But so, you know, if we were using only the traditional route, we would have to then isolate some samples of, of this new variant. We have to, we have to detect that there, that there is, even is a new variant. We'd have to isolate, uh, you know, uh, uh, samples of that new variant and then produce vaccines based on those new, um, those isolated viral particles. Um, 
and then you know production you'd have to uh, uh, essentially proliferate the virus itself with probably within bacteria um, you know it's just a much longer process with the mrna and the virus based uh, uh, strategies you can edit that mrna in a day literally you can do it in a day and then completely change the the sequence of the protein uh, that that the mrna is encoding and therefore you can change the immune response but there are multiple reasons for why so so your, your question is the mrna strategy better than the virus-based strategy um i think it's pretty comparable frankly um i i you know i could i could very loosely speculate as to reasons that you might want an mrna one more than the other but it's complete complete speculation um they they, they share a lot of the same advantages so um so yeah so and we're very very lucky that that um they were developed so rapidly um, okay, is that the issue with HIV that it just mutates too quickly? Is that why it's cur currently incurable? No, so so um, so HIV can uh, uh, mutate, but HIV is, is what's called a retrovirus, so it actually can integrate into host genome, right? So the the genome of the cells that have been infected uh, is changed. That's different from coronaviruses, different from the influenza virus, different from uh, essentially any other virus you could probably name. There are a couple that can also do it, but um, but HIV is like the one. Um, yeah, and H HIV. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you just meant HIV has meds that can make you cure. Yeah, essentially. I mean, you know, HIV uh, treatment has, has advanced very very significantly. It's just at this point, assuming that somebody has access to treatment, which not everybody does, uh, for for reasons that have nothing to do with medicine, um, it, it becomes a chronic condition, uh, which is fantastic. Um, mRNA vi viruses are difficult to create an effective vaccine due to their lack of proofreading ability. Oh, oh, RNA viruses. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, well. So, so believe it or not, SARS-CoV-2 does have proofreading capabilities. Um, it actually does. It, it's it's actually kind of long. It's like thirty thousand base pairs, I think, is its genome, and it does have proofreading capabilities. So that's why it doesn't mutate as as rapidly as it could, given how how many people now have this virus. It could it could, you know. Uh, anyways. Uh, but but so like like the influenza virus does not have proofreading capabilities. When when we're talking about when Nabil is bringing up uh, proofreading, what he's referring to is um, there is essentially a, a you know virus is a very simple thing, right? And it's it's essentially just a couple genes, and one of those genes can be what's called you know a proofreading mechanism where basically if there's an error in replication, right? If if a mistake has been made, an A is include rather than a U or something like that. Um, in the sequence of, of the replication, then you know that is technically a different virus, right? That is technically a different version of the virus. By and large, and so proofreading capabilities is, is a mechanism that comes through and literally uh, like checks <laughs> to see if there if any errors have been made, right? And then will either remove, or, or well, well, can can substitute in the correct uh, uh, nucleotide, um, or you know, um, uh, or just get rid of the the, the byproduct. Um, you know, we have. Our cells have proofreading capabilities as well, um, but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you know, th there is kind of like a, a, if we don't get vaccinated rapidly enough, it is theoretically possible that that there will be a variant for which these vi these vaccines are ineffective. However, um, there are a couple reasons to be um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, optimistic regarding the ability for these vaccines to. Um, protect against SARS-CoV-2. The first one is that the changes that we've seen in these viruses are not all that tremendous, right? They're, they're not huge changes uh, uh, or deviations from the standard SARS-CoV-2, right? Or the, the initial variant, let's call it. Um, and so, you know, they're not massively different. Um, and so as a result, a any antibody that can recognize, again, I'm showing it on YouTube, that spike protein will almost certainly recognize any other strain of that that still has a spike protein. The second is that, and this is another advantage of vaccination and, and everything like that, is that you don't just produce what are called monoclonal antibodies. You don't just produce an antibody that recognizes only one specific part of that protein. It's really cool. The immune system is amazing. <laughs> um, what you produce are antibodies that recognize, you know, so the way uh, antibodies work is basically they recognize what's called an epitope or like a, a specific sequence of amino acids that compose the protein, right? And so, you know, the protein has many, many amino acids, different, and it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like recognizing a puzzle, right? The, the, the piece of a puzzle, right? 
let's say you have a puzzle piece and it's, it has four sides and it has different little knobs in different places on each of the sides, you know, how would you recognize this specific puzzle piece, right? Well, you could only have one of the other ones that you know is complementary, right? You, if it binds there, if it, what do you call it? When puzzle pieces match, if they, you know, if they fit together, <laughs> um, then, then you know, ah, this is the puzzle piece I have, right? Because this one fits. But what if the puzzle piece is turned and the wrong side is presented to this one puzzle piece? Well, then it doesn't fit. So you, you don't know if that's the one you're looking for. So rather, if you have multi, if you detect this piece by the piece, all of the, you know, a piece that's complementary to all of its sides, then you're much more likely to be able to recognize this piece. Same goes with polyclonal antibodies. You have antibodies that recognize multiple parts of the spike protein. And so as a result, even if one part of the protein is modified through a mutation of some sort, then you still have antibodies that recognize the other parts uh, of the spike protein. So, so you know, those are the main reasons to be to still be very optimistic about the efficacy of these of these vaccines. Um, like an enzyme binding, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, and thoughts on Biden choosing geneticist Eric Lander as president uh, of uh, science advisor and director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP. Yeah. Um, Good news, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, so I don't know much about Eric Lander's background, um, but uh, but I am I'm thrilled, of course, uh, that uh, Joe Biden has decided to ele elevate um, the director of the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. That's like the that's like the the main. It's what it sounds like. It's like the main office that directs scientific research priorities, and you know it, it comes up with sort of. Uh, the, the administration's perspectives on science, or it should at least, you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the director of OSTP is, is a very influential position, but it's not a cabinet level position. They don't like, like sit, you know, at the situation desk or whatever. <laughs> um, and so that means that the, you know, a scientist, a highly trained, high, with scientists with a lot of resources will have a direct stake, a direct influence on White House policy. That is fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I dig it. You missed my first question. Oh, sorry about that, Frank. Um, okay. Uh, uh, thoughts on Biden? Oh, yeah. No. Okay. I, I did catch it. Oh, I did. I did miss it earlier, though. Sorry about that, Frank. This is on YouTube. youtubecom slash anthropoid. Um. All right. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, Biden is also just so corrupt. You know, like, if you're looking for a politician if you will only support a politician who has who you like 100 percent right that you agree with on everything and that you think is not corrupt you're going to be looking for a politician for a very 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 long time it's politics it's fundamentally it, it is like based on sort of controlled corruption <laughs> um and you know if you'll only support somebody with whom you agree 100%, you might as well just only ever vote for yourself. I don't agree with my wife on when and where to use ketchup. Like, <laughs> okay. Um, everybody complaining about our politicians should run. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I don't know anyone who with OCD who's been cured, but I think it can be alleviated. Oh, did somebody bring up OCD? Um, you know, I talked about OCD actually last week on uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash anthropoid. Um, specifically in the context of COVID-19, because, you know, of course. But um, OCD, but I talked about the basic biology. Actually, I can show part of that talk here right now on YouTube. A rotating, uh, the, uh, the region of the brain that is sort of like central, at least in part, central to um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And that is the striatum or the striatum. You know, both the dorsal and ventral striatum. And so um, you can check that out. It was like a couple weeks ago, maybe. Maybe it was last week. YouTube.com slash anthropoid. There are no cures for OCD. Um, that is correct. I think Javier uh, suggested. Um, um, but there are treatments. There are treatments that reduce severity. Um, recognize seems anthropomorphic. Uh, how does a white blood cell recognize something? Well, that's the term we use in science. I mean, literally recognize. Uh, recognize just means that they have a, a capability to interact with one another. Uh, specifically interact with one another. But like, you know, we, we use anthropomorphic language in science constantly. We are, after all, anthropoids. Get it? That's my screen name. But we are, after all, human. We're primates, right? We, we didn't evolve to, we evolved to understand things in a certain context. And so as a result, you know, 
I, I would agree with you. It does become problematic when we're anthropomorphic when we talk about evolution because people, you know, will, they'll say things like, like talking about COVID-19, like this virus wants to mutate. This virus wants to mutate so that it can, it can evade our vaccines and our immune systems. It, the virus doesn't want to do anything, right? That's just a shorthand. Um, uh, what it's doing, it, it's, it's, it, it is manifesting the influence of natural selection, right? If a mutation that just randomly occurs, it's constantly randomly occurring, if a mutation results in a viral strain that, uh, that is more contagious, particularly if it doesn't kill people as rapidly, then that strain will become the dominant strain just because it's more contagious. It can spread more rapidly than prior strains. So it's not that the virus wanted to, to mutate to become more uh, uh, contagious. Rather, that is just a, a natural byproduct of how viruses replicate, right? Um, but, but I mean, it's a fair point. Like I, I, I do my best to try and avoid anthropomorphic term, terminology, but recognize it's just the right word for, for what's going on there. Um, but but you're I think you're you're absolutely justified in being skeptical of the use of that terminology. Can dementia get better or memory loss gone? Um, well, you know people experience memory loss for a variety of reasons. Um, dementia isn't the only one, um, unfortunately. But uh, generally speaking, if somebody's diagnosed with dementia, then you know one of a, a handful of um, diseases has progressed to a certain point, to a certain threshold beyond which now symptoms are recognizable and overt, okay? Um, yeah, a aging in general, right? Of course, we all experience some kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a certain degree of cognitive impairment. I certainly already am. <laughs> um, and, um, and so if there is an underlying disease, like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, you know, there's a bunch. Um, if that disease has progressed to the point where now there are overt symptoms, then there, there are no cures, unfortunately, for dementia. However, there are certain treatments that can delay the onset of the most severe symptoms of dementia. Uh, those are available. Uh, and there are certain lifestyle factors that one can um, pursue to delay the onset of dementia. Uh, everything from you know diet interventions have been shown to be moderately beneficial following the Mediterranean diet and the mind diet. Um, in fact, there's a study that came out, I brought this up earlier, that showed significant delays to the onset of Parkinson's disease um, for people who adhered strictly to the Mediterranean or the MIND diet. The MIND diet was even more effective. Mediterranean diet is just like green, leafy green vegetables, lean protein, lean sources of protein, like poultry and fish, um, uh, essentially no simple uh, uh, carbohydrates like you know, sugar, uh, unsaturated fats like oil uh, uh, rather than olive oil rather than butter. Um, and seeds and nuts as, as sort of like a supplementary food. Um, Mediterranean diet also can call for red wine every now and then. Mind diet does not. Mind diet basically accepts all of that, but then also controls for um, salt intake and does not cause uh, call for the uh, red wine. Uh, but And, and it, women experience a, an even greater delay. It was something like 17 years of a delay of the onset of Parkinson's. I think men, it was like eight, just under nine years. Um, so that's pretty remarkable. That, that's a lot. I mean, that's a decade. Um, but anyway, but this was specifically Parkinson's. For dementia, um, uh, uh, you know, similar diets have been associated with better outcomes. Uh, lifestyle, other lifestyle interventions. Uh, basically one or two days a week of moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise for about 30 minutes. That's been shown to be moderately effective. Um, uh, well, well, it's not the sulfites. Um, it's it's the actual ethanol itself, right? It's, it's the actual al alcohol itself. But it, I mean, if you're talking to somebody who enjoys a beer every now and then, so I'm not saying that all, um, it's all, you know, <laughs> verboten. So using HAPS, I am on HAPS, Candy Taker. Uh, go to my profile and you can find my profile on HAPS, HAPS.TV. Uh, that's another live streaming, live chat uh, uh, platform with a lot more tools, by the way, than Periscope has. Um, and I'm over there. So go, go check that out, HAPS.TV. And, and the platform is excellent. They're, they're, they're different in some very important ways. But anyways, uh, let's not get derailed here. Um, so exercise, avoiding social isolation. That is like one of the like, most consistent risk factors for the, de the development of dementia is social isolation. Basically people who, who basi you know, lack any interaction with their family members, with friends, and that can happen fairly easily here in the United States at least, and I'm sure in the rest of the world as well. Um, what else? What else? 
oh, you know, there is one dietary thing. Like, I am uh, loath to recommend any kind of specific food or anything like that because that's just not how nutrition works. But the one that has been fairly regularly uh, uh, associated with positive outcomes is uh, turmeric, uh, which has a molecule within it called uh, curcumin. Uh, turmeric is, is like most closely associated with uh, curry, uh, like Indian curry. Um, yeah, any supplements. So they actually make turmeric uh, uh, supplements. Uh, and I add turmeric to, you know, whenever I make chicken, uh, sometimes when, if I'll make steak, I, I might put some on. Um, just, you know, any way to get it. The, the, the thing with, with turmeric su- supplements is that it, it needs to be in, in something. It needs to be something that you can digest, like fat, right? That's why I put it on, on uh, meat and stuff like that. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much the things. Um, let's see. Any supplement? A- apart from that, well, so um, this is a little bit more speculative. So um, there is a supplement company called Elysium, and they're not the only one that makes a supplement that contains something in it called nicotinamide riboside or nicotinamide uh, uh, mononucleotide. Along with in Elysium's product, they have um, uh, something called terastilbene, um, which is, has that pterodactyl P on the front, just so you know. It also has that apoptosis P, the second P in apoptosis. There's two P's in apoptosis. You're not supposed to pronounce that second P. Apoptosis is a Greek word that refers to the falling of petals from a flower, falling of leaves from a tree, right? Very beautiful, I think, uh, uh, word choice. Um, but it's a Greek word, and evidently the, that, that, it's that ptosis part of the word that starts with a P in Greek, but that P is not pronounced. It's not ptosis, it's ptosis. So as a result, it's apoptosis. How is that spelled? Elysium? Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. You can also type in uh, David Sinclair. He's a geneticist at Harvard who, who is one of the founders of this company. But there are other companies that do it too. Um, uh, so, yes. My, nicotinamide, Rob, they, that, David Sinclair is a geneticist at Harvard, and he has uh, in the past worked with a, a um, scientist at MIT, um, in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, named Leonard, uh, or Leonard Guarente, I believe. Um, and these are very, very senior professors and um, whatever. I, I, I'm happy to get into this, uh, but basically they're, they're interested in understanding longevity, like human health span and lifespan, and um, they started this company. So I would never recommend that you take it just because there's not solid evidence in humans that, that it's effective, uh, but there's a lot of evidence in animals that, that it is rather effective. So um, you can check that out. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. One glass of wine was medically recommended. Go figure. Does that mean a joint each note? <laughs> so yeah, actually now, now, um, well, whether or not alcohol is is healthy or danger or, or bad for you is one of those topics. It's sort of like coffee, where there's going to be a, a big study now every year that says ah, alcohol is very very dangerous. Uh, you know, or um, you know, historically it was thought that alcohol, uh, excluding heavy, you know, like binge drinking and heavy use mild to moderate consumption was thought to be benign, if not in some cases beneficial, lowering stress, reducing glucocorticoid release, these types of things. Um, that, was, that was so so the standard was like, yeah, a, you know, a glass of wine every now and then. And then of course there was actually evidence from David Sinclair's lab. He was one of the guys who pioneered uh, resveratrol research. Resveratrol is that antioxidant molecule that's present in the skins of uh, wine grapes. That's also present in um, wine in red wine. Uh, however, it's present at, at such low concentrations in red wine that if you were drinking red wine to, to specifically for resveratrol intake, you would have alcohol poisoning. <laughs> like it would, you'd have to drink so much wine to get like meaningful amounts of resveratrol. Anyways, doesn't matter. So for a long time it was recommended and, and there were purported cardiovascular benefits and it, this was attributed to the resveratrol. Uh, also, by the way, by the way, um, I think his name is Deepak Das. He was a scientist at the University of Connecticut, surgeon, I believe, actually, who uh, ended up, he was one of the, the main figures in the red wine, resveratrol, longevity world. Um, he ended up committing suicide because it turned out that um, he had falsified a lot of evidence, like something like 147 counts of uh, uh, falsified evidence. Um, so, so some of that evidence about red wine in, in humans is, is a little bit um, questionable, but not all of it. There's, there's plenty of good science sound science that uh, suggests that it's beneficial. But anyways, a couple years ago, uh, the biggest study to date reviewed all the evidence and basically found that there is no healthy amount of ethanol that one can consume. All, it, there's no healthy justification for ethanol consumption. 
however, mo- most recently, another study came out suggesting that hey, maybe it's actually not so bad, at least mild consumption. So it's it's like coffee. Like, is coffee good for you? Is it bad for you? One study says it's good. One study says it causes osteoporosis in women, right? Um, it's just, it's one of these things that, you know, um, we're not 100%, there's no consensus on it. Um, and, uh, you know, by and large, unless you're drinking very, very heavily, it's probably not going to be the thing that compromises your ability to um, live a long time. That's how I think about it. Um, but I do, I have, since that first paper came out, I, I have dramatically reduced my alcohol intake. Um, as a result, I still have, I have like six year old, five or six year old uh, Trappist ales in my refrigerator that I've had for years and years now that I meant to drink on the night that I got back from my successful thesis defense when I essentially became a PhD. But I had a daughter at that point, so I did not. <laughs> and she came to my defense. It's very cute. Um, do you think it's okay to take supplements that warns of, that is a Prop 65 warning? Is that is, is that the California warning that it may cause cancer? I'm not sure. I, I would have to review that, Prop 65. Uh, sorry about that. Is CRISPR innovating in the neural field? Absolutely, Norsk. Absolutely. I, I Before I finished my PhD, I used CRISPR. More specifically, I used a mouse species that, uh, or mouse species, a mouse strain that was, that whose genomes was edited by using CRISPR. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for this broadcast. Thanks for joining in. Say, I appreciate it. Um, I like your profile picture. I like your rose. Uh, are nicotinamides in cigars? Oh, okay. Yeah, no. So, so nicotinamide is um, nicotine is not the same thing as is not the same thing as nicotinamide. Nicotinamide they have sort of similar they have some similarities in structure, not really very similar though. Nicotine is a totally different molecule, and and it does not have any of the same properties, uh, as as far as we're aware, as nicotinamide ribonucleotide and nicotinamide mononucleotide. Um, yeah, to totally different structures. Um, have you seen doctors treat neuropathy with medic with MS medications. Um, well, I've not seen physicians treat uh, MS or um, or um, neuropathy, so I, I haven't seen that. Um, niacin is is niacinamide. Yes, correct. Um, what is a new breakthrough in the treatments of any brain related disease? Well, okay, let's see. Well, I, I think probably the the most the coolest um, that I've seen recently is. Um, I, I covered it on YouTube, um, and it is a novel treatment for um, for t- uh, tinnitus. So basically, and uh, it's it's from an Irish company. The device is called something like Lanieri or Lanier, Lanier, Lanier. I don't know if it's French or if it's a I don't know Gaelic word or Celtic. I don't know. But um, anyways, it's it, it's it's a device that's basically a combination of sound, of like earphones and tongue stimulation. And basically, it's essentially like distracting you from your tinnitus. Um, so, so that's one. I mean, there is a bunch of cancers that. Uh, oh wait, did you were you asking specifically about neuro, brain related disease? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, well, actually, what, something that that's very very exciting um, is the treatment of Parkinson's disease, not with deep brain stimulation, not with the implantation of of electrodes. It's targeting the substantia nigra in the uh, the, the you know, whatever vent- bottom part of the middle of the brain, basically. Um, rather than doing that, or rather than L-dopa treatment and all that kind of stuff, uh, it has now been tested uh, injecting you know a couple million neuroprogenitor cells, which are basically like neuron stem cells, into the substantia nigra. There is plenty of evidence in mice that when you do that and you inject these set, these they're, let's just call them stem cells they're basically stem cells they're not embryonic stem cells there are some important differences like these are stem cells that will become neurons but the 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 challenge is will they become the right kind of neuron and once they become neurons will they integrate with um well with with the nervous system properly um you know will they form the right connections with each other um let's see let's test this out that's a little better but it, geez it's so slow um, anyways, so that's the concern, and, and you know we couldn't be sure if um, <laughs> if they would successfully integrate. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, that's a little better, but the exposure so long. Okay, um, and so uh, but they there is evidence in mice that they do indeed um, uh, they do indeed. Oh Jesus, <laughs> they do indeed integrate with their surrounding neurons. They become dopamine-producing neurons. 
and it was is a clandestine experiment that was done by a physician who had made a lot of money found out he was developing parkinson's disease funded this research using uh, a regenerative medicine using these stem cells and then essentially commissioned a surgery all on his own what was amazing was that like i covered this story on youtube you can check it out youtube.com slash anthropoid and it, it's like this amazing it's almost like a like the plot of like a liam neeson movie or like a mission impossible or something like they basically had like a four hour eight hour window to get cells from i think boston to new york and like you know so they it was like it's cool but anyways so this guy has been injected with uh, a neuroprogenitor cell so we shall see if um if they're effective what so far and this was like a year ago i think so far what it seems to be what seems to be the case is that he has um not deteriorated so basically the, the level of his parkinson's has remained static which is you know it's not a cure necessarily but it's certainly better than continuing to deteriorate certainly better than anything else we have so um so there's that i mean there's a bunch there's a bunch um yeah hello is it safe to take the covid vaccine as far as we're, we're aware absolutely um there i'll put it this way there's no reason to believe there's more reason to believe that they that th all three of the vaccines that we've talked about here in the united states and then also in europe the you know pfizer biointech uh, vaccine the moderna vaccine which my parents just got um by the way and uh which i'm you know all right <laughs> um and the Oxford AstraZeneca vi uh, vaccine, all of them, there is no reason, there's more reason to believe that they are safe than to believe that they are unsafe. And the trade off, like, even if you have an a, a unpleasant, um, you know, response, reaction, adverse reaction, the downside of catching COVID 19 is so much greater, so much downer. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what are the risks? Well, I mean, so so there have been very, very, very few severe adverse reactions. Very few. In fact, a funny, funny part of the, uh, I think the Moderna vaccine. No, 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 it was the Pfizer vaccine. So, of course, they're monitoring these patients, right? They, they you know, vaccinated thousands of people. And um, one of the adverse events was um, uh, arrhythmia, which is like your heart behaving oddly, right? It's not beating properly. That's kind of scary. I don't want arrhythmia. I don't want anybody in my, anybody in my family to get arrhythmia. But... It also turned out that he had been struck by lightning. <laughs> it's struck by lightning like a couple days before, um, which is like, you know, I could just imagine like an anti-vaxxer being like, dude, this vaccine causes lightning strikes. <laughs> like obviously they're unrelated, right? Uh, and you know, with that many people in a study, you're going to get a bunch of weird biological events that happen, weird, weird medical events that happen, right? Because thousands of people just by the law of numbers people are going to experience things like arrhythmia things like you know they'll they'll develop you know bell's palsy they'll, they'll develop all kinds of things and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the vaccine right that's just that's anticipated okay so um and, and the adverse events are for these vaccines remarkably low and i can tell you now also anecdotally my parents who are you know they're not young anymore um uh they both got the vaccine uh, a couple days ago, the first one, and they've experienced essentially zero side effects. Not even like, you know, the most common side effect is like a localized inflammatory reaction, which is common. I mean, that, that is to be expected, literally just from being injected with a thing, right? You're, you're, you're likely to get, intramuscularly, like you're likely to get some kind of reaction. There's new stuff there, right? Uh, um, and so, yeah, I can tell you both by the data and anecdotally that um, the reactions are not all that bad. Um, okay, I should probably call it a night and take over baby duty. Did you take the vaccine? I will as soon as I can. I have not yet, though. Uh, we're, we're in a very, very low uh, risk category, so we're therefore in a low phase. But I have registered in both Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, as well as in New Jersey, which is where I work. I work in New Jersey. <laughs> I don't know why I just did that. All right, um, I should call it a day. So um, I have a YouTube channel. It's called youtube.com slash anthropoid. And I talk about all a bunch of topics, a whole bunch of topics for about 15, 20, 25 minutes in depth, showing you pictures, showing you videos, all that kind of stuff. And so if you're interested in a, a deeper dive into a lot of these topics today, for example, I talked about the potential of SARS-CoV-2, the ability, SARS-CoV-2 to infect neurons. Um, so you can uh, hit the subscribe button if you're interested. Prod it, tickle it, uh, poke it. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, I don't want to tell you what to do with your subscribe button. Just touch it in some way. <laughs> um, 
Anyways, uh, uh, so youtube.com slash anthropoid. Um, and then I am also uh, using a new platform called Haps TV, H A P P S dot TV. Um, and that is essentially what seems to be the live streaming platform that is going to take the torch from Periscope once it's shuttered in a couple months. So haps.tv, you can find a link to that platform in my profile. Um, check it out. And, you know, I'm looking forward to chatting with, with all y'all. All y'all. I lived in Texas for like three, three years, and I say y'all now. Um, chatting with all of you over there um, when, uh, at, when we lose Periscope. Otherwise, um, I will see you, uh, hopefully, around the same time, same place, next week, next Sunday. See you there. Have a great week. If you're in the United States, enjoy. I hope if you have tomorrow off, hope you enjoy your holiday, and um, I will talk to you next week. See you guys. All right, YouTube, thank you so much for checking it out. I appreciate it. And as always, I'm very open to suggestions, to feedback, to you know commentary, uh, you know, uh, or, or you know suggestions as to how I could do a better job. I know part of it would be read the comments more. Uh, point taken um, but also topics that you're interested in um, I'm totally open to it um, and if you enjoy what you've seen or you enjoy the live chat whatever uh, you know hopefully you're, you'll consider subscribing otherwise um, I will see you next week see you guys